Good afternoon. I'm Councilman Chaim Deitch, Chair of the Committee on Veterans. Thank you all for joining us today. I would like to especially thank the members of the Armed Forces who protect our way of living and all of the freedoms we are afforded. I would also like to, to extend a warm welcome to the new Commissioner of DVS, James Hendon. So welcome, Commissioner. Uh, I look forward to working with you and ensuring that the veterans and their family members are adequately served within New York City. Today's hearing is an important one, one of, uh, on the future of DVS. DVS is now approaching its fourth year of existence. With a new commissioner, it is important to examine what the agency has done and what it intends to do in the future. What started as the Office of Mayor of Veterans Affairs, MOVA, was just a small office with four employees in 2015 through the passage of Local Law 113. MOVA became DVS, and today, DVS is a standalone independent municipal agency with over 40 staff members. DVS currently provides programs and services in four main areas. One, engagement in client services to ensure that veterans gain access to and have knowledge to navigate educational programs, find jobs, and create their own business opportunities. Two, housing to ensure that the housing and social service resources are available to veterans and their families. Three, Vets Drive NYC to ensure that health services for veterans are provided. And four, careers which connect veterans with resources they need to succeed professionally. In its first three years, DBS has helped veterans in a number of ways, including housing homeless veterans, helping veterans with PTSD to find employment through Vets uh, Care Program, and creating a comprehensive metal a mental health training program. As of November 1st, 2019, DVS has a new commissioner, Commissioner James Hendon, serving in a number of previous roles, including as director of the NYU Veterans Future Lab, CEO of Energy Economic Development Corporation, and COO of Block Power. Commissioner Hendon comes to DVS, having worked with our city's veterans. In addition to his civilian titles, Commissioner Hendon spent years in the US Army as an active duty infantry officer, being deployed as a mortar platoon uh, leader and battalion public affairs officer to Iraq in 2015, working as admissions officer for West Point from 2006 to 2007, and serving as a senior advisor to the Afghan border in Afghanistan from 2007 to 2009. In addition to these accolades, he has also served as a mayoral appointee on the 11-member New York City Veterans Advisory Board and is currently a drilling U.S. Army Re uh, Reservist Lieutenant Colonel, acting as the New York City leader of the 75th Innovation Command. The committee welcomes the Commissioner Hendon and looks forward to hearing what his vision for DVS and for our city's veterans community is uh, going forward. As DVS enters its fourth year in 2020 with an exp expanded staff of over 40 staff members, a budget of $4.6 million, and a new commissioner, the Committee on Veterans would like to have a public conversation with the agency meant to help our veterans. We would like to know what DVS has done, what challenges it has faced, and what it has learned from those challenges. We would like to learn more about the new commissioner's mission and vision moving forward, whether there are any fundamental shifts in operational and management, and what, if anything, the agency will be doing to address the issues this committee has already examined during our hearings over the past four years, and how DVS plans to reach its goals of better serving veterans in New York City. We also want to hear from advocates and members of the public. Tell us what you want us to see from DVS. Are these areas where you think DVS sh uh, should be making changes, improving, or remaining the same? I would, I would also like to acknowledge my Veterans Committee, uh, not here yet, and uh, in addition, I would like to thank my committee staff, News uh, Saudry, Kevin Katowski, Sarah Liss, Peter Butler, and John Russell, as well as my Citywide Veterans Director, Joe Bello for their help and uh, with this hearing, I also wanted to give a shout out to my uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, who didn't put her name here for a reason, uh, Tova, Tova Rosenfeld, thank you very much. And I just want to just uh, tell you a little story. Um, just a few days ago, I, I was honored at uh, this uh, school, private school, and uh, not in my district, and they chose to, to honor me, and you know, I accepted uh, a few months ago. So as I went up to the podium, the MC came over to me and said, "You know, do you know why? Do you know, do you know why we want to honor you? Do you know why we decided to honor you? Because um, you have uh, 
I was around the corner from 250 Broadway, and every time I see a homeless person out on the street, the first thing is I walk over and I ask that individual if they're a veteran, because we all know that uh, we have many resources for veteran, for veterans, and if he or she is not a veteran, then I call 311 and I, I uh, call Breaking Ground to come down, and I, I wait there until they come down, they mandated to respond within an hour. So he told me it was, I was around the corner from City Hall and he saw me speaking to a homeless person for about 20 minutes and he came over and took a photo of me and I remember that photo because when I turned around I saw the guy running away because I was going to chase him and uh, he said I was just impressed that no one was around, it wasn't a photo op and you went there and to and you was talking to the homeless person. So I just want to tell the advocates and everyone listening how important it is when you see a homeless person outside on the street, especially in a weather as, as today where it's really cold outside, or even during the summer, any time you see a homeless person, please always make sure to approach. And if he or she is a veteran, you could reach out to DVS, you could reach out to my office, and we'll make sure that we'll send someone over right away. And uh, if, if, not, if it's not a veteran, if uh, he or she is not a veteran, just make the call to 311. It'll take an extra five minutes or ten minutes of your time to make that call. Uh, and it's extremely important to reach out because we all know that you cannot force a homeless person to go into shelter. But having conversations with people living on the streets is extremely important because then they feel that we care, someone cares about them. And hopefully eventually, if it's not that day, hopefully the next day or the next week or the next month that that person goes into shelter. And uh, please, um, I just want to tell, I know the advocates do an amazing job when it comes to homelessness, but I want to just send this message out to all the people who are watching this hearing at this time. So with that being said, I want to um, acknowledge one of my colleagues who's here, Alika Amphrey Samuel, whose husband is a veteran, right? And she's been a strong advocate and, she, and, and also, um, she, she just joined not too long ago. She joined the Veterans Committee. And uh, so I want to thank you and thank you. Thank your husband. Who I, was, I had an opportunity to meet him for, all, for everything that he has done in giving us our freedom. So um, I would like to ask the council now to, to administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You can begin. Two. Okay, testing. Um, <clears throat> before beginning my remarks, I want to uh, also recognize the the chair and the committee members, as far as those who are here and those who are not, between uh, Chair Heim Deutsch, uh, Councilmember Alik Ampri Samuel, uh, and in absentia, uh, Councilmember Paul Vallone, Councilmember Matthew Eugene, Councilmember Allen, myself. And I want to also echo what the Councilmember said in the public record, as far as just emphasizing outreach to our homeless, to those who are in housing insecurity, veteran or not, that we all should do our part to help these people. So I yeah, definitely uh, echo uh, those sentiments. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Deutsch, members of the committee, and advocates. Thank you for convening today's hearing. My name is James Hendon, and I'm proud to serve as the commissioner for the New York City Department of Veteran Services, or DVS. I'm joined today by Vincent Garcia, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Ombudsman at DVS. First, I would like to wish you all a happy new year. As we move into this next year of life, we also embark on the exciting journey of a new chapter for this agency. As we refit and retool our future, for the future, we will continue to provide the services and offerings that assist our constituency while developing innovative and invaluable offerings to better connect and serve our veterans. It is our goal in entering this new chapter to continue taking an active approach in improving the economic development, wellness, and housing security for our veterans, families, caregivers, and survivors. As always, DVS staff members are proud to meet council members at our Veterans Resource Centers to maintain our ongoing collaborations to better the New York City veteran community. Since 2016, DVS has experienced tremendous growth. Initially occupying a space in the mayor's office, uh, we've evolved into a team of over 40 employees and growing. Since our inception, we have tackled some of the most dire situations facing our more vulnerable veterans, including homelessness and mental health. As we maintained our commitment to that goal, we have actively begun to include a handful of programs and services to address a number of other concerns facing veterans and their families in New York City, such as service to service and pay for success. 
And looking back, the experience of the last few years has helped us see the opportunities for improvement to better serve our constituency and the growth that comes along with it. With a committed staff and enthusiastic commissioner, DVS began a revolutionary undertaking to become the first local municipal agency to handle veteran issues. In being the first to complete anything at this level within the country, there were a number of successes in areas that needed improvement. In entering this agency at this current time, I've been fortunate to reflect and understand that while great work has been done, we need to do more. First, we learned that there is no substitute for boots on the ground or in-person connections. Veterans and the number of subgroups we serve include the elderly, students, family members, LGBTQ persons, women, those transitioning from service, or even those now just entering the service. Each requires a unique, diverse, and personal approach that technology alone cannot solve. In reflecting upon those people whom we have reached and understanding the need to expand our reach, DVS commits itself to not only target the aforementioned groups, but strive in providing them with a face and body in lieu of just an agency name and contact. Next, DVS has done a phenomenal job of assisting those in distressful situations like homelessness. Under the leadership of the former Commissioner, former commissioner Sutton, DVS, our sister agencies like the Department of Homeless Services, the Mayor's Office, and the City Council Veterans Committee, have been able to drastically reduce veteran homelessness numbers despite the uptick in homelessness in the overall city population. Most recently, DVS reported a veteran homeless count of 690, five less than the previous year uh, point in time count. Yet, while we're still committed to ensuring that every veteran has the security of a, a place to rest their head safely at night, our outreach to those not within the most vulnerable of populations, such as young working professionals, middle-class families, and those looking to purchase a home is an area of opportunity. Therefore, in entering this next chapter, we will focus our efforts towards engaging the larger market share of veterans while maintaining our commitments to more vulnerable members of our community. As we enter this new chapter, DVS is actively working on developing meaningful and innovative policy measures to empower, improve, and inform veterans of the economic opportunities and benefits available to them throughout all levels of government. Further, as an agency, we commit ourselves to better the overall well-being of our veterans, whether financial, mental, emotional, or otherwise, all the while empowering, preserving, and or maintaining housing opportunity. While this journey may not be easy, it is critical for our veterans. To begin meeting this goal, we are holding a partnership convening event on February 6th to begin the initial steps in listening, learning, and engaging with our community on a deeper level. Invitations were sent, uh, were also sent to each committee's uh, council member, along with citywide veterans director, Mr. Joseph Bellow. We hope to see you all in attendance for this phenomenal event. To be able to best assist the constituency that we serve, we first must begin to examine our internal agency operations. As we began this phase shortly after my arrival, DVS presently is undergoing a reconfiguration into three teams, current operations, future operations, and administration. Through this reconfiguration, DVS can maintain its present commitments to our constituents within our current operations team. That can include housing homeless veterans, conducting targeted outreach within the community, and engaging organizations, nonprofits, and veteran service organizations to get the word out. Under future operations, DVS staff will develop strategic and data-focused initiatives to better one's future. Once Future Operations finalizes a policy proposal, that final product will then move to the current operations team to execute. Lastly, to provide each group with a solid foundation to complete their work in, is the administration. That, this can include notable tasks such as payroll, HR, to even larger ones like our Intergovernmental Affairs Director and General Counsel to shepherd the work to completion, such as reviewing a document for legal clarity and or reviewing proposals and their feasibility within the with the number of partners involved. Next, we will bring those boots to the ground. Under our reconfiguration of current operations, DVS will continue to maintain a presence in each borough, but expand its reach with dedicated teams focused on the needs of particular subgroups, whether they are LGBTQ veterans, students uh, focused on the needs, I'm sorry, students utilizing some form of GI Bill, or those interested in entrepreneurship, DVS will expand its reach, broaden our community, and through that, empower and inform these individuals. Lastly, we seek to assist in the creation of long-lasting generational wealth for our veterans. Most notably, since World War II, the veteran community and the GI Bill has been an invaluable tool in uplifting people into the middle class and providing opportunities to do so. While there is an array of benefits afforded, 
being able to navigate the ever-changing field of benefits and being aware of those changes has prevented many veterans from accessing them. Therefore, it is not only our goal to help benefit, to help benefits, help uh, our constituents access these benefits, but to empower them with the knowledge to make informed strategic decisions that benefit them and their families for generations to come. As DVS continues its upward trajectory into this next chapter, we will continue to expand on the work we've done thus far as we seek new endeavors. We thank you for the opportunity to testify on this matter and we look forward to addressing some of the topics discussed in the coming months. We're happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so you've been involved with DVS um, as an advocate. Um, what steps do you believe needs to be changed or what services you believe needs to be enhanced? Well, look, you know, thank you for that, com that question, Commissioner. The, the way I look at it is, you know, we take this by priorities first as far as the buckets for all of this. First priority being outreach, just making sure that we have a strong relationship with uh, the 210,000 you know, veterans in this community. It all is for naught if we don't have a, that touch point with our people. That's number one. Uh, next priority is economic empowerment. I often use the analogy in the office that this is a bell curve that we're attending to, not just the left and right tails of it. In other words, what can we do if we look at all of our veterans in the community to move that entire bell curve to the right? And you know what uh, is available that we can make sure that our people know of and what initiatives can we lead or are currently leading to kind of steward that. Uh, another piece of it is housing security. I feel like housing security is it is separate from economic empowerment because it's about a hierarchy of needs point as far as having a roof over one's head. You started by talking about those who are living, who are homeless and how we can help them. This is step one. We can't do anything until we triage that for our veterans. Uh, and housing security also includes things, uh, not just what we see on its face, like the homeless, but also things like when a, a veteran passes away and may not have the means for that final resting place. How do we account for that? So that's bucketed within it. And, and last but not least is culture. What binds us is, the, as a tribe, so to speak, is that we have this shared culture and these shared values, and to make sure that we're paying homage to that, uh, be it through certain things that, uh, you know, like the parades and the various events that are already supported through this council, to things that involve, you know, say, uh, you know, uh, memorials or monuments or things along those lines. How are we culturally coming together within our group? And then what undergirds all of this is the mental health piece as far as well being. And what are we doing to help people help themselves get to a better level with the battle within one's mind, as I said at the Intrepid uh, a few months ago? So once again, the priorities for me, uh, number one is outreach. Number two is economic empowerment. Number three is housing security. Uh, number four is culture. And then, you know, what undergirds all of this is well-being. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, what is your plan on reducing veteran homelessness? I mean, I have seen, you know, I went around to um, different... Uh, uh, veteran supportive housing and as well as the um, Borden Avenue, the veteran, um, they have veteran homelessness. And a lot of times when there are housing available, when there is housing available, it takes time before they, the, the, the veteran moves into permanent housing. Um, it could be through because of uh, bureaucratic red tape. It could be because the paperwork is just sitting. So what is your plan to better work together with the veteran, veteran uh, homeless shelters and to streamline the process of getting the veterans into, house, into permanent housing? In addition to that, um, I have also seen that when a veteran passes away, uh, they have to, sometimes that apartment becomes vacant for, for way too long, whether they have to wait for the NYPD to open up that apartment to give the okay to rent it out. Um, or if, the, if there's family member, they have to wait um, for the public adjust, I believe, uh, for, for the public administrator to come in and to, and to give the okay uh, to open that apartment. So how, what's your plans of working together with the public administrator and with the NYPD and with the shelters to make sure that that process is streamlined this where we get the veteran straight into housing, permanent housing, as quick as possible? I want to make sure I've got this. So first piece is, you know, how are we looking at reducing our homeless number? That's the first thing. Next piece is how are we going to tie in with the administrators and the entire apparatus that deals with, you know, uh, housing folks? Yes. That's first. So going back to the bell curve analogy, uh, one piece of this is to work with 
within this community that deals with housing security such that we can preempt these issues. So to try to have a better touch point around the entire bell curve. So think about someone who's in this bell curve, who's slipping from the middle, who's slipping towards the left, towards being in a, a position where they are, are in this crisis point. And this goes back to the current operations, the future operations, and administrative ways that we break things down now. So for current operations, uh, in the legacy, in the prior administration, the Housing and Supportive Services line was its own entity. Think of it as an island within DVS that worked on these issues, um, which, and it did it great, did, uh, did outstanding work with it. What we're doing now is streamlining so that what we used to call our traditional engagement and community service line and what we call our housing and supportive services line are in the same group within current operations. Also, our constituent services is falls under current operations as well. So we have all these things together to try to get to a one plus one equals three dynamic, where it's not just one independent group that's trying to handle these issues, but that they've got touch points with the other groups within as far as what's going on on the ground. So for us, we're hoping the goal here is to leverage economies of scale by having all of our people as one team, one fight on these issues that involve direct touches with our people in real time. That's one aspect of it. The future operations team is the group that would help deal with issues such as what you mentioned as far as the public amendment aspect. You talked about a policy issue at, at the end of the day as far as things that government can do to make sure that these processes move more smoothly, more fluidly, et cetera. And so by re, uh, you know, uh, organizing ourselves, we have a team that is focused on these types of discussions. We want to have the firepower, do I say, to be able to enter these arguments and to, to make them effectively so we can try to close these timelines and make things more at ease uh, on the uh, housing piece. Okay, um, with the 2020 uh, being a census year, uh, what is the agency, what's your, plan, what's your plans on the agency discussing or looking to do in terms of helping to identify the number of veterans uh, living uh, throughout the five boroughs? It, it, this is bigger than the census question. This is, this is just, this goes to a larger question of how are we doing outreach period? How are we touching uh, members of our community? And a major shift for us is to go from having a geographic footprint to it, an approach of, you know, you've got the Bronx, you've got Brooklyn, you've got Staten Island, you've got Manhattan, et cetera, to more of a demographic approach where we say, you know, this is your portfolio so that we can meet our constituents, you know, on that demographic line as opposed to on a geographic line. So it's still about promoting the efforts to make sure that we get out the vote, the, I'm sorry, get the word out with census and making sure we're counted. But instead of it being broken by five boroughs, uh, for the constituencies we're looking at right now demographically, we've, uh, the 13, and forgive me, I'm gonna try to rattle them off, we've got uh, student veterans we have as a constituency. We have uh, those who are currently still serving, so guard, uh, reserve, uh, active duty, who are here in New York City. We have our uh, female veterans. We have LGBTQ veterans. We have uh, veterans who are facing housing uh, insecurity, so uh, most of that being our homeless population. We also have veterans who live in public housing. Uh, we have those who are leadership for our veteran service organizations. We have those who reflect leadership within the mental health community. We have uh, veterans who are seniors. We have veterans who are the uh, caregivers, survivors, and uh, family members uh, of our cohort. Uh, we also have veterans who are parents. We have veterans who, give me a second, it'll come to me, are working professionals in the public sector and veterans who are working professionals in the private sector. So it's really about the flavor of outreach to try to increase the amount of uh, uh, touches we have on these issues. And, and one other thing I want to add to this too is that what we deal with, when we talk about the veteran community, we always say there are 210,000 veterans in this city. What we don't know, we're working to get an idea of, is how many don't identify as veterans. In other words, I've served, but I no longer really you know, uh, acknowledge that my service, for whatever reason. It's something that is not the identity that I really turn to when you talk about me. So if I can meet you at the identity that you currently do operate in, for instance, let's say you are a working professional in the public sector, and we do the outreach where we reach you through that, that's another way for us to get you to kind of uh, rejoin the tribe, so to speak. And so this is why we're shifting to this demographic footprint. Um, we've got 210,000 people spread across 300 square miles in the city. And so we feel like this is a better way to, to begin to have this relationship. So in the DBS's da uh, database, do you have, um, we, we have an estimated number of 210,000 veterans. How many are actually identified in New York City that DBS would have their, would know exactly who they are? Um, 
we it's you know you forgive me i know it's in our local law 44 report as far as the yeah. number there i know it was mentioned at one of the prior council meetings too as far as what the count is yeah. i don't want to misrepresent i know it's several several thousand it's not cracked a hundred thousand of the 210 but uh you know i believe 75 was a number that was pointed out at one of the prior uh you know council meetings but there's a difference between just having an email address and having a relationship and so for us it's really about having that relationship which means when we let you know about things that are available to you and opportunities that you know, you respond and you take advantage of these things. Yeah, so um, what's your plan on expanding, um, get, you know, getting information from those 210,000 veterans? Because in order to actually offer them the services, we need to identify who they are. So do you have a plan on how you're gonna expand on the numbers of veterans you actually have contact information on, and how do you plan to do that? Well, for now, what we will do is uh, be sure to, you know, you have to subscribe on to, say, a newsletter. So it's not as simple as just taking this information, which we've obtained through the government vehicle, and saying, okay, let's just push something to you. You still have to opt into receiving things from us. And so for us, what we're hoping is that as we start to have to go from a push to a pull uh, approach. In other words, uh, instead of us being in a situation where we're constantly trying to look for people to tell them about things, that they're seeking us out, that they are, want to take advantage of different benefits of government, that that's a way to kind of bring them in the mix of saying, okay, I want to receive uh, your newsletter. I want to be able to access the podcast for DBS and things like that. So for now, as far as of that group, it's a fine line between having someone's information versus automatically using it to do outreach in this way. So, yeah. I don't get it. So, so how do, how would you like expand on that? Like, how would you do outreach in order to? We want to look at a grass yeah. top instead of a grassroots approach, chair. Like, so, a great, if, no. if if breaking ground goes out there and identifies a veteran, do they then report it to DVS, or do you uh, does DVS uh, work together with breaking ground and to get the numbers of veterans because they they are the ones who actually identify the veterans out in the street. So do you plan on working together with Breaking Ground and to work together with it? Because I'll tell you, the agencies, we have so many agencies in New York City, and it's very unfortunately, very unfortunate how they don't work together. Yeah. There's no part, there's almost zero partnership uh, when it comes to agencies working together. So what is your plan on, on bringing that partnership together, ex especially those agencies that have to do with... Um, uh, with veterans, those who deal with veterans. We want to leverage the future operations side of the house for that. So when we think current operations, think of people who are physically f working with our constituents in real time. The future operations side uh, includes this intergovernmental affairs piece or this outreach to the grass tops, so to speak. So making sure we're tying in with uh, different veteran service organizations and with the breaking grounds of the city. As far as the grass top uh, approach is reach out to these groups, say, hey, here's what we have going on. Please feel free to put the word out. And as we, you know, uh, hopefully people will take us up on the various uh, offerings that we have as, as far as how we see it, Chair. Yeah. So do you, have, do you have a number, I don't know if, do you have the number of how many veterans you actually identified out of the 210,000? Do you have it there? Yes, sir. We have, uh, it's 75,000 veterans of the 210 that we currently have some form of correspondence with. 75,000. So how do you follow, how do you follow up if there's a, a residence change or something or if a veteran moves out of New York City, or if a veteran moves from one shelter to the next, or one supportive housing um, development to, the, to another one, how do you follow up with that? Well, sir, what we do is we, uh, just thank you for the question first off, and what we do is we always try to, to keep up to date. You know, if there are within the pipeline, especially for, for homelessness services, there are those outreach coordinators and individuals that have that connection to the community, that have that connection towards the shelter and whatnot to ensure that where these individuals are transitioning, there still is some point of contact and a warm handoff that's passed on. But I think also moving forward to what the commissioner's vision has, it's being able to further that outreach demographic to ensure that when there is a connection based upon DVS to that individual, it doesn't end with that day. It doesn't end with that week. We continue to follow up with them. We place that that body and that individual versus and just the agency and the mindset to to ensure that we're always keeping up to date and we invite them to our services and offerings and events that we're having uh similar to the partnership event that convenes on february 6 uh, excuse me february 6 to be able to uh further that communication further that environment that we're having with our veterans that this is ongoing this collaborative and this is a family and in doing so we bring everyone together the the seventy five thousand. how long has, has that been seventy five thousand? is it the last two years three years I mean, uh, these are legacy numbers in other words this is, these are numbers that reflect the touches that we've had since the birth of the organization of DVS. Yeah. So from day one, um, like do you spot check, like do you make phone calls to like, just to make sure that 
um, those veterans are still living in New York City, those veterans may be um, not with us today. And just to make sure that we have, that the 75,000 is like a hard number of 75,000. How do you spot check? How do you check that? Yeah, there have been a, a number of initiatives that have been done through DVS where we have reached out to um, the individuals that we've had on that mailing list or that communication list that we had per se. So in that, for example, if there ever were physical mailings, we actually track the number that would come in potentially of uh, the return addresses and try and follow up in some way. So there are actions that are done to ensure that what our numbers are and to increase those numbers, increase those communication aspects. Uh, but what that full number is, is, um, I won't be able to, to give you at this time, sir, but I'm more than happy to circle back on what that may or may not look like. Do you know what the numbers were like the previous year? Now it's 75,000. How many there were? I, I believe we were tracking around the number of, uh, I think, 56,000 or so comes to mind. Uh, but I can I can follow up with what that number was and what the improvement has been made from a year's time, for example. So how accurate, if you have to take a guess, how accurate do you think that list is? Like, percentage-wise, mm -hmm. like from the 75,000, how many do you believe that the information you have is like accurate. Would you say like 50% um, of the list or 60%? I think I would, uh, in, in, I'm not really sure of giving a, an exact accurate in a, in a statistic number, sir, but I think that in the, the trustworthiness of it, I would say that's given the rating of good. Um, but like anything else, you always have to improve and make better and work with uh, what has been evolving within the time space, which DVS is actively doing so. And Chair, I, want, I just want to underscore what's, what's complicated here is it's deeper than just how many numbers are on the how many names on the list. It's do you know what kind of touch points do we have with our people, and you know the way that we're approaching this for now is if we have different uh, initiatives where we have to deliver as far as making sure a certain number of our veterans are taking advantage of something, are we able to meet those numbers? Are we able to deliver to those things? You know, so I'm, I'm we're very mindful of the list and cultivating it and whatnot, but it's also just the overall relationship is the undercurrent of it. Uh, what is the agency's plan to address um, the various needs uh, between different veteran populations? Uh, for example, World War II vets uh, or a, um, the need of a veteran who, of, who, went, uh, who served in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan. So you have different needs of different veterans that served the country in different ways. So um, how, do, how do you address these different needs? I feel like that goes to the demographic outreach as far as it oftentimes these things through doing conducting say demographic outreach so if you take that world war ii era that korea era veteran then our person who has a seniors as a portfolio would likely have uh, within their kit bag not just uh, offerings that are germane to uh, specific to veterans but also things that uh, the department of the aging has uh, at its disposal here in the city to make sure our people know about that as an example uh, likewise for someone who's a post 9 11 veteran who may be in their 30s or 40s maybe a working professional that's someone for whom their needs may hit uh, them as a parent, as far as dem demographic, or them as a working professional in the public private space. So we're trying to, this, the demographic outreach, we believe, will be able to help us meet people where they are with their issues. And not to, I have to acknowledge, you know, uh, Council uh, Member Samuel, as far as, you know, those who are caregivers, survivors and spouses, so we can be able to meet them on uh, the terms that, the things that are valued to them as well. So from the 75,000, we'll get back to the 75,000. And so for some reason I'm like focused on that. From the 75,000, do you have it, um, do you know exactly what the different veteran populations are from that list that you ha currently have? Um, like I, what the needs are, if it's, yeah. um, you know, the different needs that uh, each veteran might have, which may be um, a little different than one, one, to one from the other. Right, I, I agree with you, sir. And I think what we're actually doing within that, that 75,000 number is actually developing a marketing campaign for outreach. As the commissioner said, to not only determine those subgroups and those demographics as towards outreach, but also understanding what can we do on our end as an agency, but also working with our sister agencies to get a better addressing of what that population may be. So working with those city agencies that may work, for example, uh, with an older veteran population to see what those needs are, what are the unique needs that don't just go in that demographic of age per se, but goes uniquely to that veteran demographic that tend to be older. Um, as uh, I'm sure many of us here know, uh, the Vietnam veteran population is our largest population within the city. And within those carry a number or a myriad of unique needs that this marketing campaign 
could be able to, to utilize and to address. So moving forward, we are continuing our partnership with city agencies to do so, but also actively developing this marketing campaign to, to really be able to focus in and hone in on what those needs may be for those particular populations on the numbers that we currently have, as well as the outreach further to get a better holistic view. And, of and I want to add to that too, as far as the, uh, for the local law 44 uh, report, uh, looking at uh, across the spectrum at the, the common needs, the common themes that emerge are housing, are employment, and legal assistance are you know, the common things that continue to emerge. And when we say legal assistance, I just want to underscore that approximately 15% of our veterans have less than honorable discharges and are you know, often seeking upgrades. So that's something else that you know, we're currently pursuing as far as the discharge upgrade issue. 15%, yep. Hey, you know, uh, in the past, I've been trying to get information on the uh, veteran suicide rate here in New York City. Uh, the number that people speak about in the United States of America in, this, in our country is 20 per day. Um, and I couldn't get anywhere um, previously with finding out to see what the suicide rate is. This when we know what resources, what more resources we need to put in and what more outreach we need to do. What are your plans in order to, um, number one, to find out the, the numbers of veteran suicide here in New York City? And number two, do you feel it's important for us to know in order to understand, um, you know, veterans that who suffer from PTSD, who um, just, you know, one day to the next, that's just, you know, commit suicide. So I'm trying, Vince, I know you can help on this. I'm tracking that uh, even prior to coming in, there have been uh, discussions with uh, uh, the, uh, the medical examiner's office as far as being able to, you know, identify um, this type of information and uh, working with the uh, DOMH, the Department of Mental Health, as well to try to get a better handle on these things. I know these things, that are, this is work that's in progress right now. Um, as far as how do we deal with this, this also goes back to the, it is parallel to the issue of veterans uh, who may not identify that they have served. This other issue of you have folks for whom it's about the vernacular and how we phrase these things and not maybe uh, saying things along the lines of mental health first aid or mentioning um, specifically suicide by name, but just overall well-being. So for us, you'll see a shift in how we communicate these things to our veterans just to get them open to having these discussions by it being a, a greater focus on well-being, which is something that we're going to work with the, uh, the uh, Thrive NYC department on how we best uh, get people to open up and accept or put their hand up saying, hey, I could, you know, I could benefit from this help. So the Thrive NYC has been criticized, and if you read the papers, it's almost every, every week. And do you feel that the services that um, they currently have on mental health for veterans, do you think that is succe uh, successful? Or do you think they're successful with working with the veterans, with the services that they currently have? I think this, this ties back to us in the relationship piece. In other words, when I look at Thrive, Thrive will, will say, hey, we want to support what gives outcomes and what works in this space. For us to be able to you know, see what works, we need to have better relationships with our people so that we can have more of our members of our community embrace uh, aspects of well-being so they can be able to have informed decisions as far as what they're investing in. So it's not about necessarily speaking whether Thrive NYC works or not. It's really about has our outreach gotten to the point where we've got strong enough touches with our people so we know who's taking advantage of what and what does work, what does help with better outcomes? Does DBS have the number of how many veterans actually get services from Thrive? Do you have those numbers? I don't have them. No, right but now. are there numbers? We, um, I can definitely circle back with you, sir. I can yeah. double check on our end and be able to, to figure out what the numbers num are. There are numbers we can get it to. There, there are, I know that there are numbers. But there are numbers. Have, but there are, there are numbers, right. uh, Chair, okay. yes. So if, you have, if Thrive would have the numbers that they report to DVS, how, would, um, how do you do the outreach to those people who get the services to determine if those services are, are being helpful to those veterans? What are, you, what are your plans to determine that those services are um, sufficient for those veterans? I think for us it will be uh, still working with our, our current operations team or those who do that uh, on the ground, it touches with our veterans to just uh, get that feedback as to wars, what works, what doesn't work. Okay. Um, do, you do feel it's important to know um, the suicide, the veteran suicide rate here in New York City? Do you Absolutely. Feel oh, okay. Yes. So it's something that you will, will have that information, you know, the next hearing or two. I mean, it's something that you're working on now. We're, we're, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can... And, 
assure you, council member, that this is actually something that we're, excuse me, chairman, that we're actually actively working on. I'm actually spearheading the initiative myself, along with DOHMH and OCME, um, to determine what those numbers look like, where the population is, and how best to really be able to access that data. To that point of being able, um, you know, one, to know the numbers, but I think two is, is realistically, what can we as society and the people do better for our veterans? Those yeah. are suffering from mental illness. And in first doing so, we have to understand what do those individuals look like? What what are the, the tasks and standards that, that we're going to place upon ourselves to be able to access and, and aid this group? But in doing so, we have to know what they look like, what their ages are, where they're from, what's effectively affecting them. And that is something that um, us here on the DVS side, we take very seriously and we're actively working with DOHMH um, to be able to get an agreement forward to realize that data, push that data out, and create meaningful change from there. Okay, so th I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, if you have the information for the next hearing, um, number one is the suicide rate in New York City, and number two, if the services that Thrive is currently um, giving to the veterans by doing outreach to those individuals who are using the services to check if um, that these mental health resources have been helpful to them. Because if it's not, and they have no, no other place to turn, then, it's, then it could be a problem. I mean, it is a problem. So these are the two things. Exactly what you just said, you just put them both together. And I think that's very important. Um, so I'm going to go to my colleagues. Anyone have questions? Yes. And, uh, yeah, I want to acknowledge uh, before that um, we're well, he left now. Matthew Eugene, and we're also joined by uh, Council Member Alan Mazel. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and it's good to see you again, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. I just have um, three questions related to housing, outreach, and, of course, family support. Um, the first one with housing, are you at the table at all, and you meet in DVS with this administration, the mayor, um, with HPD or anyone else, um, we have a lot of development that's happening throughout the city. And the conversation is always around um, units for our extremely low and low income families and can we get more units for seniors. But what I rarely hear is can we get more units online with these developments for um, veterans. And so um, I'm just curious to know if you are at the table at all um, with this administration as it relates to yes, veteran um, units? Yeah, that, yeah, we, we are, uh, council member, we are, uh, as far as uh, with social services and with folks from NYCHA too on these issues, as far as making sure that we can, that the capacity is available for members of our community um, to the point of having recurring meetings with City Hall with that, at that low so we can get a handle on it. So yes. Um, because for me, it's a matter of, we're in the budget season now, and we need to know what the ask is. And if you are having conversations, what does that look like? Like what type of vouchers are readily available um, to the city for our veteran families and individuals? And what should we be pushing for as a council member or body um, within these development projects? And to have that information, if you're having conversations and we know that um, – there's opportunity there. What are we pushing for? And in our own individual budgets, what are we pushing for? So that information would be extremely helpful. I know to me personally um, mm -hmm. within my um, district. And mm -hmm. in addition to that, are you having those same conversations with HUD with vouchers they may have available? So I know, uh, yes, we are. I know we also have the, that HUD VASH continuum, which is like a hybrid version of the HUD VASH specific for, uh, you know, uh, veterans here in New York City. So we do have that. Uh, I can't speak to the frequency. I know that for City Hall, we have recurring check-ins uh, on these things. But as far as HUD, uh, it's an ongoing relationship in that, you know, we are very much thick as thieves with them. And I do hear what you're saying as far as, you know, what does the ask look like as far as areas where maybe, of you know, Places where you can advocate for things as far as capacity for us, for our, our members who face housing insecurity. I do receive that message, I just want to say, so we can get back to you on it. Okay, yeah. and um, last with the housing piece, the reason why I'm mentioning that is because as the chair of the Public Housing Committee and having conversations around public housing, and if you're having conversations related to NYCHA and LIS, um, the fact that I don't know that is a bit problematic um, or could be problematic. And... I'm having conversations with HUD about 
domestic violence um, um, housing opportunities and, again, what's happening with public housing and Section 8 and my own personal conversations with the HUD representatives related to um, VASH and everything else. And so if you're having those conversations, I think it would be helpful for us to have that conversation together. Um, and so um, if you're at the table, you can shoot me an email or something and say, hey, Alika, you know, it would be helpful if um, – you're in on this meeting or provide me with the information so I can know how to push. So that's with housing. Mm-hmm. Um, with the outreach piece of it. Thank you, by the way. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, with the outreach piece, you mentioned direct touches. And I've um, said this in previous hearings. When I am at the VA hospital with my husband or I'm at a meeting with him at the Dave office, I do not see the presence at all of DVS. I've said that before. I've said that countless times, actually. Um, And when I'm sitting in the waiting area within the different offices, I find myself doing constituent services, and I find myself talking about DVS and going on my phone and getting people to contact DVS, and they don't have a clue. And I've asked this question before, what type of outreach are we doing in even the VA hospitals? Because and when I say I'm, I am there several times a year, and just a suggestion, because, again, I do not see any type of tabling or any type of informational pamphlets anywhere. As a suggestion, you can look at the places and offices that um, people go to more frequently, not just the waiting area, but Um, the x-ray department and the CT scans, those particular waiting areas on like the sixth floor are heavily populated and they have so much space for tabling. It's just empty space there. And I think it's a great opportunity to to maybe partner with um, those facilities to just go in and and I'm talking about 23rd Street. I'm not talking about Fort Hamilton. That's a Mm -hmm. different conversation, but... um, there are so many ways that you can do more outreach. And again, personally, I don't see those direct touches in certain places that could be helpful and beneficial. And the last, as far as family support, several years ago, your predecessor testified that Elizabeth Dole Foundation announced New York City as a hidden hero city. Um, Can you tell us what DVS has done since that time to maintain that status and what your plans are in regards to outreach to caregivers of veterans? For the family family support question, Councilman, I'm going to have to get back to you as far as just uh, getting uh, read up as far as the Hidden Heroes um, City and the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Forgive me on that. Um, for the well, we will circle back to you on that. Just so you okay. know. And then, as far as the issue of, as, of DVS having a presence at the VA hospitals, that's also duly noted. As far as something we will uh, not just look into, but you know, make sure we can make this a reality with how we do our outreach in these places. Uh, this goes back to the core issue of outreach was the missing piece of the puzzle. As someone who's coming in as a new commissioner, we want to just make sure that we. Um, have a better relationship with our veterans. I feel like the first few years of this organization was just building it out, just actually getting it on its two feet and giving birth to it. But uh, right now we're in you know, a, a season where no one cares how old you are. They care that you deliver today, and we're trying to work that. So, yeah, thank you about that. That's it. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Malika Amphrey. Samuel. I, I just want to mention um, one of the points that she spoke about is the outreach. So DBS, you have 40 people working, 40 people working in DBS. And the actual outreach is what five set. How many, how many people you have in, as um, peer coordinators? The, right now, the, with, with the this new con- configuration where outreach is all housed under current operations. So think constituent services. Think um, those who are doing uh, work with our folks facing housing insecurity. How many people do you have actually out on the streets, like out of outside of DVS, like not in the DVS facility? I'm going to say like, approximately. Just I don't have the work chart in front of me. Forgive me. I'll, I'll say uh, approximately. Uh, right now, I'd say 15 approximately. 15. So my question is, is it possible to, like, um, ask the 40 employees that you have in DBS, like, for at least, like, for one week to do as a, like, uh, uh, a trial just to, people should just go out and bombard the communities, community boards, um, community council meetings, civic meetings, and just to go out and hit all five boroughs 
And to let people know whether there's veterans in the room or not, because everyone knows a veteran, to say DVS exists and this is what we do. And, you know, to go to what uh, Alika mentioned is that people, every person in the city, 8.6 million people, whether you're a veteran or not, should know that DVS exists. So if we could get at people, you know, if you can't force, you know, the employees to work after 5 o'clock, maybe they could come later and just to go out and just like once a week, at least once a month, just to what's, go out. What's, and I think what's complicated about that is, and I appreciate the suggestion too, is, you know, as an agency, we, we do have uh, employees where we, we I, I cannot say to someone, you know, person who's hired to do these things, you need to do this on top of the current responsibilities you have. It's it's a delicate area for lots of reasons as so, far as yes, just workers' and I, rights. I understand that. So I just, just, no, I appreciate the question. I understand. But if you would ask, would anyone say no? I'm wary about asking because of it. it's the... Um, the idea of compelling a, a worker to do something that is um, beyond the scope of what they've been asked to do while still asking them to maintain what their current duties are, it can get touchy when we talk about the different levels of employees that we have in the organization. So that's one side of it, which is unfortunate. I'll just call that out right now. Someone who's new to government, who's new working here, I understand the frustration. Um, the other side of it is we're trying, trying our best to work as smart as we can and leverage the resources around us, um, you know, between a meeting with the folks in the public engagement unit for the mayor's office, the folks from the community affairs unit also, um, trying to see what we can do to amplify and have economies of scale with the various organizations to our left and right. I recall us having a conversation, we said, hey, I've got, you got eight people right here in my office. I guarantee you we'll take you up on that at some point as far as reaching out to our various uh, elected officials and their constituent services shops as ways to try to make sure that we can amplify our outreach and people knowing who we are and what we are. It's just, um, it's, I, I unfortunately have to push back on being able to, or giving an order to all of my employees saying, hey, in addition to the current work, you also need to do this. Because it, it's, it's just so delicate, unfortunately. Okay, I, I just want to ask the commission yeah. if, if you could reach, if the commission could reach out just to your general counsel to ask, could I ask my employees, do you mind doing it? And if they say okay. no, then just if you could just tell me that they said no. But if they if they permit it, then let's do an outreach and let's get all the advocates. Let's get I'll I'll go out and I'll speak about it. if we have let's say, especially like a week of reaching out to people in all five boroughs to hit all 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 civic. Uh, organizations, community boards, everyone. Let's do like one week at least just to get everyone out there with, with literature, with information on DVS to say DVS exists. We need to take care of our veterans and we need your help. And we just want you to know that there is an agency um, that helps. Right? Mm -hmm. And let's all, I'm sure I could, ask the, I could ask the advocates and I'm sure they'll be willing to go out. Anyone not willing to go out? No, I see no, no yeah, hands raised. Yeah. Sorry, I think this one wanted to so, ask something. Yeah. yeah, so let's get everyone out. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's definitely a great idea, sir. And I think that one thing to, that's also important to know, it's not necessarily the, I think, the requirement of having staff to go out there. I think what, what we actually see and what we find is that staff do that on their own initiative anyway. If they understand that there's a meeting within their, um, their location, if they understand that there's something that they find very dear to themselves, because what we find in DVS um, is we find those that have served, we find those that currently serve, we find those that are already connected to the community in the number of ways that they are connected. And you'll see that those individuals do go out there and they do um, speak on behalf of DVS and interact with individuals on DVS without the, the mandate to do so. Um, but I do think that, you know, if there were um, opportunities to, to do better, to get out there, I think we can find it. But I, I also believe that providing that opportunity um, by a volunteer choice, I think there will be people that would go. To okay, so yeah, we'll, I, we'll ask our general counsel also. Yeah, just to, so, to yeah I just want to. I just want to yeah. respond to that. Um, I res I attend probably I would say almost one hundred percent of my meetings in my district, right? Not fifty percent, not seventy five. I try to hit every single event in my district myself, not my staff. Um, I like to be there my, myself, and from all the meetings I go to. Every month, um, I think there was there were one or two times that I saw DVS at the meeting, and that was in Community Board 13. So when you tell me that you have people out there, and I don't see it when I attend all the meetings, almost all the meetings, if not all, and I don't see them, to me it doesn't mean anything. Because if I go out and I go to all the community council meetings, the community board meetings, and the civic meetings, I don't see DVS there except there was on two occasions you had a representative there. To me, it's meaningless. Joe Bellow works for me. 
right, my community-wide coordinator, I don't tell him to go anywhere because he goes in his own. He's all over the place. He's in all five boroughs. I don't, I don't have to tell him. I don't, I don't say, Joe, you know, where are you going? Or can you hit this meeting? He does it on his own. I see everything. I get feedback. And he's amazing. He's just great. Right? So if we could get everyone, instead of going back and forth and telling each other stories, and just to say, let's do it. Let's work together, and let's get everyone out there, and let's let people know what Alika Ampri Samuel mentioned. Let's get people out there. If it's the, if it's the um, you know, having tables and having literature out there, let's do it. I mean, I don't know what the big deal is. Let's get, it, let's get everyone out there, and let's get it done. Let, people should know. If I walk into one of my uh, community, community meetings, and I go to the crowd, I said, anyone know what DVS is? And no one raises their hand. To me, it's, it doesn't mean that there was outreach done. And I have veterans in my district. So if, you know, I would be satisfied, and I think we will all be satisfied if we walk into any meeting in the city of New York and ask people, do you know that DVS exists? And everyone raises their hand and says, yes, that's beautiful. And that's, and that's what our goal, that's one of our goals should be regarding doing outreach. People should, it should be part of a conversation. If it's not part of a conversation, uh, then, it, then it's worthless. You know, we have an uptick of hate crimes here in the city. And after speaking to the police commissioner, I have a bill that's being drafted that when the police department reports on crime, it's always under seven index crimes that is reported by the FBI. So I have a bill being drafted, and I spoke to the police commissioner, to have hate crimes as part of a conversation at every ComStat meeting, at every priest and council meeting. And he said, excellent idea. And they, they started. Within two weeks, it's all done. Now it's a conversation piece. So every priest and commander needs to speak about hate crimes after they're finished speaking about the seven major index crimes. Imagine every meeting we have a discussion about DVS. We have 210,000 veterans and probably even more in the city of New York. Every conversation in this city, no matter where you go, there should be a conversation about our veterans, those who gave their life and those who continue to protect us and those who who gave us our freedom, gave us everything that we have as New York City residents, as um, people who live here in, in the United States of America. We owe it to them. So why shouldn't we have a conversation about our veterans everywhere we go? Uh, Chair, I'm, I, I'm on board. I completely agree with you as far as, you know, ways to look at it. I'm thinking beyond just that one week as far as that, that, that blitz, as you would call it. I'm thinking about... Um, this, is, this goes back to grassroots versus grass tops. So having an idea of, you know, where are the, the locusts of leadership within New York City across these different spectrums as far as a demographic approach across the city so that if we, I keep telling folks in the office, you know, it's not about just hunting the green M&Ms, which can be very difficult to find. I need to find people who have huge boxes of M&Ms all together and we then pluck the green ones out, if that makes sense. In other words, looking at outreach from more of a, a meta perspective of reaching out to the broader leadership in the city of New York and making sure that folks know, hey, DVS exists, and that they help us get the word out and have those veterans come. Because remember, we've got a lot of people who don't even identify. So just to, you know, as, as you know, the, the issue we're dealing with is about 8.6 or so million New York City residents, of which roughly 210,000 are in our community, but they are spread all over this entire expanse. And we have many who don't even say, I am a veteran. And so for us, it's about trying to, you know, uh, do things like what you said as far as a blitz, effectively, you know, to kind of make sure we get out, they get the word out, but also thinking long term. You know your district and all the council members know their districts like the back of their hand as far as who the leaders are in your district. Whenever you need something done, you know who to reach out to, who's in certain positions of influence here and there. I'm trying to develop that same thing within this organization, that level of muscle memory. Because think about you've got 169 constituents on average and they're confined to one geography. You know who they are. We've got about 210,000 constituents and they are not constrained by geography. They're just dispersed. So the only way for us to do it is to do the same playbook that many people on this dais have done as far as understanding who the leaders are as you can help to amplify your effect. So I'm with you. I'm just saying that in the back of my mind is this longer term strategy. Um, so yeah. No, I tried doing longer term, but then I went to short term. No, no, no. I'd love yeah, to do I long term. So if, if you could give me a commitment, Commissioner, that 
we, we're going to do outreach, and we're going to start, let's say, next week, and we're going to get all the advocates. We're going to get everyone after you speak to your general counsel to see if your staff could go out to, to hit the streets with literature and everything and share it with other advocates. If you give me a commitment, our hearing is done after I take a few questions from Paula Valone, <laughs> and I take the, the panels here. So if you give me that commitment, so, we're done. No pressure. It's all depending no pressure, on my yeah. questions. Is that right? Is that right? Um, we're going to do the homework as far as what we're able to do legally. Uh, on this, and, and okay, we'll, if you could just get back to me, and if they tell you yeah. no, then I just want to know what, um, you know, yeah, just yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. If they tell you yes, then we're good. Then, then we'll see you. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, and you know, I in, in my district when I when I go to my meetings, I speak about the veterans, mm -hmm. but I also like for someone from DVS to actually come out there and say, hey, I work for DVS, right? So the people in my district know because I'm the chair of veterans and I speak about it, but I would love to have people from DVS go to all 51 districts, and to really give them a bond and let everyone know that DVS exists. It's very simple. For me, right? success is getting and, a and, place. And, and when you can identify, when, you, when you're trying to identify, because a lot of, because you said many veterans don't identify themselves as a veteran, maybe then once they know DVS exists, then we can get more people, we could raise the 75,000 to maybe um, 200,000, I don't know, and we could really make an impact. And this is just about, it, it's a very simple thing because it's all about outreach. So we're not going out there with uh, with a uh, a shovel to you know we're not working for like a contractor and we're not out there with a hammer drill. It's not heavy work. It's pretty you know reaching out to people, just letting them know. It's, the whole thing is five minutes. Mm -hmm. At each meeting, if it's someone speaks for five minutes, you know you go you hit the you hit the meeting every few months. We're done. We're good. It's excellent. Um, I'll, I want to go to Paul Valone. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Another great hearing. I just want to introduce myself. Nice to meet you, Commissioner. Congratulations. I'm starting my seventh year on Veterans Committee. Couldn't think of anywhere else I'd rather be. So you've got uh, council members who are advocates, who are natural allies. So I would suggest using with us and, and taking, like Chaim Deutsch just said and Malika just said, uh, we are the eyes and ears of the district. We know where our veterans are. We know where the DVS is not. Mm -hmm. So I would meet with us. Quickly, I would think the Veterans Committee is some a crew of council members you'd want to meet with and take the advice. If Alika says, just give me a call, you give her a call because nobody knows more uh, than she does in her family's um, history. And I always listen to her testimony and her and her husband to guide me also. So I think these are, are your key personnel that can help you very quickly. We worked with Commissioner Sutton very well over her term. Um, we have a district of always the largest amount of veterans and the largest Veterans Day Parade out in Northeast Queens. So uh, having you come there and be present there, being out in the outer boroughs, um, a year where a budget is being talked about with no growth and possible cuts, you have to be the champion of our veterans to fight for every dollar to make sure you keep it in this agency, try to grow it, and probably have to redistribute it. Because if we're not seeing dvs where they need to be then we need to take a look at where they are how we get them into the hospitals into the courts into the districts how they have that presence we'll happily work with you we fought to create dvs when it was just an office i am deutsch has been advocating for veterans every day and i think um hearing that staff's not going to take the extra step i i don't agree with that i think my staff just like Councilmember Deutsch, and uh, they will, because if they're working with veterans, they know it's not about the pay. It's about doing the right thing for our veterans, and that's not a matter of clocking out at 5 o'clock. That's a matter of being there present every day, being taking the extra step at our local civic groups and our community groups and our folks that want to hear from where we can advocate for DVS, making sure they are on the New York City ID card when they were being left off. All these things were because we championed up here to say, no, 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 that can't be. So my, my tip for you and to work with you is work with us. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We know what needs to be done, and we will get that word out there. We want to meet you and the staff. My one question, I guess, for this point, because we'll have many hearings in the future, is outer borough complaints for DVS presence has always been a concern. Do you have any goal that you want to bring to change to work with obviously I'm Queens but this is a question from all the boroughs that you can change the perception and the reality of DVS in the outer boroughs well 
Thank you for your remarks, first off, Council Member. And, and just, I, I didn't say it before, but everyone on this dais, thank you for your advocacy. Like, we exist because of you and because of others who sat in these positions on this committee. Um, first off, you know, for the outer borough complaints for DVS, it, one piece of it is to uh, make sure that uh, people such as yourselves, folks who have constituent services groups, that you know when you recommend someone to DVS that they will be a, treated appropriately. In other words, knowing that we've passed this person or that, who has this need off the DVS and they've gotten taken care of. So a lot of that goes back to having these relationships and talking with our elected officials, not just yourselves, also our borough presidents and other electeds to make sure they know, hey, you know, we've got this so that the trust is there. I feel like this also is baked into us improving our outreach arm as far as, you know, being known as a group that will respond and be right with folks. That's one thing. And I say this as someone who lives in outer borough myself, I completely understand and empathize there. Um, I have to add, though, that our, our center of gravity, our main office where our constituent services occur, is at one center street. In other words, when we have things where it's beyond um, what we see out in the outer boroughs, but someone needs to come in for additional uh, white glove support, so to speak, that is something that comes back to Manhattan. So that's why these numbers often skew that way. But I pray that as we grow the entire pot, as far as outreach goes, that we see uh, these numbers increase on the outer boroughs. And as we get a better relationship with the main folks who make these referrals, who tend to be people such as yourself, you know, so as we restore that relationship, that we'll be in a good spot. I'd be remiss if I didn't say, and I want to double down on something that Vince mentioned. What's, we've already got people who are working their day jobs and some. It's just, it's such a nuanced challenge with identifying this particular constituency. We're going to tackle it together. And, you know, I appreciate the advice and the wisdom that uh, the men and women of the committee have on this. Uh, because for us, you know, I have folks who are already putting in a certain amount of time, but then say, okay, I want to do more, but how do we best direct that effort such that it sticks to landing with increasing our traction with our community? So we can then handle things such as the economic empowerment, handle things such as housing security, handle things that involve culture, all undergirded by mental health. So it's still, uh, yeah, I definitely look forward to working with the council uh, going forward, not just the members of this committee, but beyond just to get some advice on how to work smart and not hard. Because I fear that we've been working very hard on these things, but we need to best canalize the effort such that it has the greatest impact. Um, something you were saying before I just wanted to mention. To me, success is maybe it's not necessarily just that we have a DVS person at each of these meetings, but that we have cultivated an environment where the word gets out to these different places. Like, in other words, doing everything we can, but to ultimately connect, mobilize, and empower the entire veterans community so that we have this synergistic effect where more people know what this is and more people can help, you know, uh, uplift uh, who we are as the veterans in New York City. So, uh, Commissioner, you. oh, you done? Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so, do you believe that all 8.6 million New Yorkers should know what DBS does and that DBS exists? Yes. Yes. I, I, I think it's not just that. It's knowing that who we are and what we exist, but also working to help us move this entire bell curve to the right. That's the issue. It's yeah. not just about knowing. It's also, it's a relationship and it's everyone hits, no one quits, we win, the approach to uplifting this community and the, and the caregivers and the survivors believe, and the families. Yeah. You also believe that we need to do like major outreach into all communities and to make sure people know about it by having people go in and speak about um, DBS and the veteran services? I do, yes. Okay. I say that recognizing we can't be every single place at every single time. No, so we've no, got to be no, think, this is yeah, why I need I advice from uh, you men and women. But, on how but, to, but it makes sense yeah. what, we, what we mentioned here, like having, you know, DVS. I mean, again, it's not about the DVS staff um, going out. Um, but like Paul put it in, in a few words, saying that no one's in there for the paycheck. They're in there because they want to help veterans. So I'm sure that they're all going to want to go out and, uh, and do outreach. You know, if they live in Queens, they'll do it in Queens. If they live in Brooklyn, they could do it in Brooklyn. But it's also important that if they can train and they could have other people, other volunteers, to go out and speak on their behalf with giving them the proper information, that would, that would, that would, be, that would be sufficient. That would be fine. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be necessarily DBS's employees going out. But if they can train other people to, and to assign volunteers, say, listen, can you do this on behalf of the veterans? Like they have an auxiliary program, right? So to have volunteers for DVS, mm -hmm. right? And say, listen, go out and help us do our job. And I'm sure people, volunteers out there will say, yeah, I want to help our veterans, but uh, we, need to take, we need to take a proactive approach by uh, recruiting volunteers who are out there, not just these advocates who are here every single day who are living 
veteran services each and every day, but to, get to expand it. You know, so I personally don't care if it's, say, uh, an employee of DBS that comes to my meetings. It could be a volunteer who DBS trains and gives that person the information to come into the meetings and discuss it. But it should, all, it should be part of a conversation. Every meeting, it should be part of a conversation. And that's, that's basically it. So I'm hoping that uh, we could work together. And I just want to say for the record that um, Commissioner is, is a very good listener. You know, I have five kids at home. I have four kids left at home and one's married. And it's not always like, you know, they don't always listen to me or sometimes they make believe that, you know, I'm, what I'm saying is not important to them when I ask them to take it to garbage. But anyway, um, he's, a, he's a very good listener and I want to thank you, Commissioner. I think we will move forward from here making sure that, um, uh, you know, we'll have this great partner, partnership between you and the council and advocating for more resources for the veteran advocates. So I want to thank you for being here today, and I want to thank you for your partnership and also, you know, the conversations that we have had in the past and your passion and for being uh, um, uh, a veteran yourself and, uh, and you know, sticking up for, for those who are less fortunate. Thank you very much. Any, uh, Alan, any questions? No. No? No questions? For you? No, okay. It could be, it could, what do you want to talk about? Yeah, whatever you want, yeah. It's open. I do want to say I look forward to the um, partners meeting next week, I mean next month, um, and it's uh, in East New York, Brooklyn. I just oh, yeah? Just wanted I to invited? Say that. It is in Brooklyn, that's all. <laughs> so thank you, Commissioner, and we're going to call, we're going to call, I think we have two panels. If you have time, if you could just I'm listen to yeah, what they have. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, James Fitzgerald, Amanda Krause, William Alvarez, Eric Rosenbaum, Jeremy Butler, and Joe Vitti. We can slide around, I think. No, it's all right. I think, can you maybe slide around a little bit and we'll... You're in good hands with the week, that's all I have to say. Okay, you can get started. You can start from the left and just a reminder to just state your name and organization. Thank you. James Fitzgerald, NYC Veterans Alliance. I'm the deputy director. Good afternoon and thank you to Chair Deutsch and committee members for this opportunity to testify today. My name is James Fitzgerald and I am the Deputy Director of NYC Veterans Alliance. A member-driven grassroots policy advocacy and community building organization across, or that advocates veterans and families as civic leaders. 
We work with more than 150 community organizations across the New York City metro area to promote events for veterans and families posted online at ourveterans.nyc. Our year-round online resource hub visited by more than 4,000 users each month. We also remain the only organization dedicated to local level advocacy for veterans and families here in New York City. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to present testimony before you here today. I would like to uh, begin by extending congratulations to Commissioner Hendon uh, on his recent appointment as uh, head of the Department of Veterans Services. Uh, we appreciate and thank him for his continuing service to not only New York City, but the United States of America. The New York City Veterans Alliance was a key advocate for the creation of the Department of Veterans Services to support our city's approximate population of 210,000 veterans, about one-fourth of our state's veterans, plus an estimated 250,000 caregivers and family members connected to those veterans. Our membership strongly supports our continuous efforts to set high expectations for the role of DVS in New York City and beyond. And there is much, much to be optimist, uh, optimistic about as we look forward to the future of DVS. We applaud the great work that has been accomplished by DVS, but there is still much work left to be done. Therefore, we present some items to highlight concerning the future of DVS. We applaud the mayor's preliminary, preliminary budget proposal of $6.68 million for DVS in fiscal year 2021. But we believe the steady increase in funding will allow DVS to continue growing and improving the quality of its outreach and services. With increased resources, the next fiscal year should show high marks in performance as the agency truly hits its stride. Two, we strongly urge the inclusion of an agency chief contracting officer, ACO, in DVS's budget and staffing proposal. DVS needs the ability to manage and monitor their significant contract with Northwell for Vet Connect NYC, as currently overseen by, as currently overseen by DYCD, an agency with, uh, that does not have fluency or competency with vet veteran services. The ACO's contracting and procurement expertise can enhance the agency's ability to provide crucial oversight of discretionary funds from the council to organizations that provide services to veterans and their families, as well as managing its own request for proposal processes. Oversight of city funds going to veteran services is basically an agency responsibility and would at last bring DVS into alignment with the state and federal counterparts. We urge the council to ensure DVS has no further delays on establishing and managing contracts and procurement going forward, as this is a necessary function for DVS to truly operate as an independent agency. Three, we strongly urge continued investment in DVS's robust and capable full-time human resources staffing so that it provides best-in-class in-house support for the agency's growing cadre of employees the vast majority of whom are themselves veterans and family members. Retention and development of DVS's current staff can ensure the agency attracts and keeps the best talents and as it builds essential knowledge and experience over the long term, best serving our community. City government is the largest employer of veterans, military reservists, and their family members in New York City. And it needs to be the best employer DVS should be fully empowered to be a shining example of what right looks like in supporting veterans, military reservists, and family members as employees in city government and in city as a whole. Four, we strongly urge that DVS establish in-house capability to provide consultation on and direct filing of VA claims. In an era where veteran service organizations no longer have capacity and funding to meet the demand of this essential service to the veterans community, it is incumbent on local government to step up with VA accredited staff who do have this capability. DVS's community outreach staff are currently not capable to offer direct assistance with VA claims and this, is so, and, and this service is also referred out. With the increased funding projected for the next fiscal year, we strongly urge the council to support DVS and being able to provide this essential service to our community. Five, 
DVS's core service and accomplishment should be accurately reflected in the mayor's uh, in the annual mayor's management report, and it should also be transparent about uh, areas where more support for improvement is needed. For example, last fall's uh, MMR report that DVS provided homeless prevention assistance for 438 veterans and permanent housing for 158 veterans. Both of those numbers representing fewer numbers served from the previous year. Not included in the report, not included in the report were the more than 600 veterans who remained homeless in the city's shelter system, or an explanation of where further support was needed to get those veteran services and permanent housing. The MMR also shows the number of community members engaged and given services, but the definitions of these metrics should be more clear and representative of, a, of the true work being done and the impacts on the lives of veterans and families in New York City. We look forward to improved reporting of DVS's impacts in future years and improved transparency about further support DVS needs. Um, I, I would like to, before I conclude my testimony, I would like to uh, uh, respond to the Councilwoman's uh, earlier uh, comment about uh, veterans and the uh, HUD bash. Uh, many veterans currently right now do not qualify uh, for the HUD bash. They're currently using City Phelps. Uh, we're more than happy to connect with your office to provide you more data about uh, what some of the advocates are looking at uh, in, in concerning that. Um, I uh, thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony today. Pending your questions, this does conclude my testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Deutsch, members of the City Council. My name is Joe Vitti. I'm the supervisor for the Visit and Nurse Service of New York's uh, uh, Veterans Hospice Program. I'm also a proud to have served in the Military Intelligence Corps uh, in the U.S. Army. I'd also like to extend a welcome to Colonel Hendon. Uh, we look forward to working with you and your office as well, sir. Uh, Visit and Nurse Service of New York, VNSNY, is the largest not-for-profit home and community-based health care organization in the U.S., providing care to more than 44,000 patients and health plan members every day. Venus and Wise Hospice Program conducted approximately <clears throat> excuse me, 876 veteran patient admissions. This consists of approximately 26% of our World War II veterans, 20% Korea War veterans, 18% Vietnam, and the other 36% consist of peacetime or other uh, veteran eras. Uh, we have earned a level five status, the highest level you could earn, uh, with the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization's We Honor Veterans program. This is a collaboration between the Department of Veteran Affairs and the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization for hospice providers who have provided superior care to veteran patients and their, and their family or caregivers. In addition, Venus and Y Certified Home Health Agency offers in-home health care services such as physical, occupational, speech therapy to patients who need rehab services from an injury or, and or illness that they may have. Lastly, we are proud to be a preferred and contracted partner with the Veterans Affairs Administration under the newly implemented Mission Act. Venus and Y has, the, has had the honor to work with DVS since its launch in, tw in 2016, and they have assisted with things such as recovering uh, a patient's discharge papers, their DD-214s. Uh, this helps me recall a memory that we experienced with a, with a, with a proud uh, Marine Corps veteran that we had. He was a survivor of the Marine uh, Beirut uh, barracks bombings in Lebanon, and he was the father of three young children. And he had lost all of his records, including his DD-214, and was uh, going through some severe financial crises. His only request in his final days were time in, in our nature of care, time is of the essence and typically against you. His only request is, was to receive a military burial uh, from his fellow Marines and to have his children know that he served honorably as a Marine. This meant everything to the patient. With the quick turnaround time and the assistance of DVS, they were able to recover his DD-214 in addition to help organize and authorize this patient to receive a burial in Calverton National Cemetery. I cannot begin to explain or, or describe the emotion in that room and what it meant to, that, to, that, to those children and his wife. 
our gather data and within our um, within our electric medical records show that our veteran patients are aging, which confirms the large, the alarming stat that that of the 22 and a half million veterans in America today, 18 million are over the age of 65. Veterans make up approximately 25 percent of all the deaths that occur in America today, approximately 1,600. And this this really conf this really uh, goes into the complexity of why we need to conduct outreach and efforts with with the organizations here in this room and DVS and the committee here because of the complexity of the VA system, the systemic poor health literacy typically we can find within the veteran community and that many veterans never fully access, utilize, or exhaust the benefits that they're entitled to. Therefore, VNSNY requests your support for our outreach efforts that would help fellow veterans access the support and resources that they need and deserve for themselves, their, their, their loved ones, and their caregivers. If there are no questions, this concludes my testimony. Thank you. We may need to do a joint hearing with TIFTA then. I think the veterans and aging we've been talking about with Councilmember Samuel uh, for quite some time, and we just can't get DIFTA to really prioritize what we're talking about in this room. So it might be time that we have that exact conversation about the amount of veterans who are seniors and with the speci specific type of services that need to be provided just for that. Yes, sir. I think it's time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Butler. I'm a Navy veteran, uh, currently serving Navy reservist, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. I uh, appreciate having the opportunity to testify today. Um, IAVA's members are spread throughout the nation, but I'm proud of the fact that our headquarters is located here in New York City. Uh, since we were founded in 2004, IAVA has been successful in fighting for policies to meet the needs of our nation's veterans and first responders, and we're proud that IAVA was an initial proponent uh, for the creation, proper funding, and oversight of New York's DVS. We want to see it succeed. We feel that it has enormous potential, and its establishment was a historic moment uh, for veterans of New York City. DVS can serve uh, to significantly streamline access and improve service delivery to many of the most critical veteran-specific programs and resources already available here. I'm here today to report on matters that I believe will help improve and strengthen uh, DVS. I appreciate uh, the chairman raising the issue of uh, military and veteran suicide earlier. That has been and remains IAVA's uh, number one priority. Uh, he'd mentioned the, the figure of 20 a day. Uh, unfortunately, the numbers are going up. They're going in the wrong direction. Uh, in our IAVA's 2019 annual member survey, 43% of our members reported suicidal ideation since joining the military, uh, which is actually a 12% rise uh, between our 2014 survey and the 2019 survey. 59% of our members personally know of veteran who died by suicide, uh, which was a 19% uh, rise since 2014. Uh, we're waiting the results of our 2020 survey, uh, but initial uh, findings show that those numbers continue to go up uh, and not down. Uh, the urgency to effectively deliver critical and relevant services to veterans in need has never been greater. Uh, he'd asked uh, if, if enough, or I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit on his question, but his question was basically, you know, has Thrive NYC and DVS uh, done enough uh, to deal with the issue of veteran suicide? And I can say that the, the answer is, is a categorical no. And that's not a criticism of DVS. It's not a criticism of New York City. Uh, it's a criticism of our country. Uh, we have a national suicide crisis uh, that's not being dealt with. Uh, and the fact is that more resources are needed, more focus needs to be made on uh, making those resources available to veterans, and more uh, attention needs to be made uh, to connect veterans to those resources. In order to deal with the increase in veteran suicide, DVS must have the capability to serve veterans in crisis in a timely manner. A clear deficit we see within DVS is the lack of a comprehensive case management component and an over-reliance on third-party programs to make referrals and connection to resources. DVS was established in 2016, but the department still does not have an in-house veteran service officer or case manager. IVA recommends that DVS create and adequately fund these positions. An in-house veteran service officer would be able to advise clients on their VA benefits, initiate discharge upgrade applications, and assist veterans in filing the necessary claims or appeals. These positions are critical to the success of DVS and the city's veterans. Removing barriers to getting uh, the veterans the services and benefits they earned will prevent them from falling into the cracks of a giant and intimidating bureaucracy. Without deeper integration into the veteran services infrastructure in New York City and nationally, uh, the, the potential of DVS will be limited. 
I would also like to note uh, that DVS does not have an in-house agency chief contracting officer. Uh, with an annual budget that exceeds $4 million, uh, that means that these funds are currently monitored by other city agencies uh, that are unrelated to veteran services. This process adds unnecessary steps and could possibly lead to error and delay by staffers who may be unfamiliar uh, with DVS's programs and the needs of the veteran community. IAVA recommends that in order to most effectively manage funds and award contracts that the DVS create and adequately fund a contracting officer position. Again, I appreciate the time to testify and uh, look forward to answering any questions that anyone might have. Thanks. <clears throat> My name is Eric Rosenbaum. I'm the president and uh, CEO of Project Renewal, a New York City homeless services pro nonprofit agency. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Deutsch and fellow, fellow city council members. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to testify here today. For more than 53 years, Project Renewal has empowered individuals and families who are homeless or at risk to renew their lives through critical programs focused on health, homes, and jobs. Last year, uh, sorry, each year we serve nearly 15,000 New Yorkers, including hundreds of veterans. We're grateful to Speaker Johnson, Chair Deutsch, and the City Council for their generous support of Project Renewal's Homeless Prevention Services for Veterans, support that's been crucial for us to help veterans across all of our programs. <coughs> In fiscal year 2019, we provided health care to over 140 veterans at our mobile medical vans and shelter-based clinics and through our psychiatry and substance use disorder programs. We successfully placed more than a quarter of the veterans living in our homeless shelters into permanent housing, and in the past two years, over 87% of the veterans we admitted to our housing programs have successfully maintained their housing thanks to our ongoing support services. <clears throat> what I want to focus on today is the life-changing impact that our workforce development programs have on the veterans we serve. We believe that the men and women who have served our country deserve sustainable employment and a living wage. Our workforce development programs, which help our clients obtain and keep career path jobs, serve 42 veterans in 2019. One such program, our award-winning culinary arts training program, places 80% of graduates in jobs, higher than the national average for similar programs. We've placed veterans in great jobs at restaurants, institutional and corporate kitchens, and at our, own city, so, at our own social purpose catering company, City Beat Kitchens, which employs our trainees. <clears throat> Additionally, our Next Step program provides job training, internship placements, and retention support for our clients, including 36 veterans in 2019. A Queens native named Andrew is the perfect example of how our comprehensive services, including job training, help veterans overcome the complex challenges they face. Andrew served as a sonar technician in the Navy. His career was cut short when he became addicted to crack cocaine. He couldn't hold a job and spent years in and out of homeless shelters. Then Andrew came to Project Renewal's Recovery Center, the nation's first outpatient clinic for homeless adults struggling with addiction. He enrolled in Next Step and we trained him for a career in social services. Today, Andrew is employed and working towards independent living thanks to his new job. He's been drug free for over seven months. We want to continue renewing the lives of veterans like Andrew. With further support from the City Council, we have an opportunity to expand our workforce development programs and ensure that more veterans achieve the economic stability they need to, leave, to live independently. We applaud the City for creating the Department of Veteran Services over three years ago. Project Renewal strongly supports the Department and values our role as a partner in its mission. We look forward to working more with DVS and welcome suggestions for greater partnership in the future. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions after I blow my nose. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, my name is Amanda Krauss, and I'm the founder and CEO of Row New York. Um, we bring competitive rowing and academic support to mostly young people from New York City, uh, mostly from low-income, under-resourced communities. Uh, we also started in 2012 an adaptive rowing program for New Yorkers with cognitive or, and or physical co uh, disabilities. We added to that a discrete program really focused on veterans to bring the on-water and off-water programming to veterans from New York City. Uh, 
usually we have about 100 and hun or 110 veterans rowing with us each year. Uh, people might sort of picture this as, you know, a quick jaunt onto the lake or the river. It's actually much more than that. Um, and we have a lot of um, gratitude towards Council Member Deutsch and the committee members, as well as the speaker for being so generous in their support of Roe New York and our veterans programs. Um, I think what I learned in seeing our vets uh, on the water in their program, and you're going to hear from William Alvarez in a moment, is that it's much more than getting into a boat. It's learning to row the boat, balance the boat, move in sync with your fellow veterans, and um, find strength and, and a team out on the water. We row on Meadow Lake in Queens in Flushing Meadows Corona Park, and we also have a site on the Harlem River where our veterans train as well. And they don't just train, they compete throughout the Northeast, both indoors and on the, on the water. And I think what I've heard firsthand from our veterans who have been involved in our program is that they find a sense of camaraderie and accomplishment um, that is very unique and really encourages this sense of self and being out there and working on something greater than themselves together. I personally have had the um, opportunity to coach, or we say Cox, um, William, <laughs> and an indoor regatta. And um, I'd say that I would encourage each and every one of you, if you ever want to come and visit us on the water, um, come out. Council Member Deutsch has, has come out and visited us, but come see this group of men and women in action and in this day and age where there's a lot of um, a lot of sadness and a lot of difficult things going on, you will see a lot of hope and a lot of strength with this group of individuals. And um, we're just very grateful to the council. Um, and I'm gonna turn this over to William to speak a little bit about his experience. Okay. Is that good? All right, yeah, I can come closer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is William Alvarez and uh, this is the first time I've spoken in public, so you have to excuse me. Um, I'm a native son in New York, and I'm a combat veteran. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I've been uh, active with Row New York, and it has made a big uh, impact on my life. Uh, I would say previously, I was more uh, uh, isolated and uh, basically stay my, by myself. But now I feel like uh, I'm another person. I'm more active. I'm, uh, I feel good about myself. It's, it's almost like uh, not having to take any medication. Um, I compete and uh, my first race, uh, competed up in uh, Boston, and uh, the VA said, well, if you compete, we'll uh, make you special legs. And uh, I'm wearing them to show them to you, the VA. What it does, if you want to see, if you're interested, you probably won't see it again, but <laughs> these feet flex, I have to unlock them like that and you can see, <coughs> see. For the rowing. That's so, that's so when I'm in the boat I get tied in and uh, I can operate the oars much better and be more competitive so uh, actually on my first race up in Boston I did come in first. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, so now I'm training for a big event in San Diego on April 4th. Uh, row New York is going to uh, sponsor me. So I'll get there to row, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I train three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday night. I mean, Tuesday and Thursday, and 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. You know, it takes a lot to get up at 8. I mean, to be ready at 8. And uh, it, has, it has been very beneficial. Uh, I've, 
people have talked about suicide. I've seen uh, combat veterans having trouble with PTSD. I've seen suicide and I've seen homicide. And uh, I think being active is the best medicine uh, today. Um, uh, I just feel better about myself and uh, a better outlook on life. And uh, it's good to have that camaraderie with other veterans. It's very, very supportive. And uh, I, I you know, don't know what else to say. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. It's a real pleasure to come here, and I appreciate it very much. Also, that I like to say that, that I think the veterans appreciate the work you do because they feel like somebody cares. You know, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez, and thank you to the panel. Um, I do have a question. How did you find out about Roe? Uh, the uh, VA made an announcement that there would be an introduction or introductory event. You could talk to people about it. And um, it just seemed like something I would like to do. So I tried it out, and I've stuck with it ever since the last uh, three years. So were you in the VA hospital, like a waiting area, and just heard a over <laughs> an overhead announcement? How did that go? Uh, there's a, a gentleman, Jonathan Glassberg, in prosthetics. And uh, he sent me an email. Okay. We are always recruiting. So I actually brought some business cards. Um, <laughs> um, and our team just emailed me or texted me where we recruit from, if anybody, if you're interested. But um, I know that outreach is, is a huge part of what the staff does. Um, and we're always looking for more veterans. So to all of you as well, um, no experience necessary. Um, it's a very adaptable sport, and um, we, we will do anything to get our veterans to and from the location and fully supported. So, That's my next question. Yeah, yeah, a lot of accessoride. Um, but then to the races, we, we do that piece. Um, okay. But yeah, I'm, I brought some cards, so we're always, always recruiting. Um, please, you get to have William as your teammate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Um, so I do have a couple of questions um, for the panel, and anyone can answer. How are your, how are DVS's goals aligned with the work that you actually do? Visiting our services. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. The first thing I would definitely uh, say that stood out to me when I was listening a few minutes ago was outreach. Um, I was mentioning in my testimony that I do uh, a, a lot of work with our with all with our veteran patients. I was mentioning the VA, but uh, uh, you know the 876 hospice admissions that we did, veteran hospice admissions that we did, uh, a great majority of those came from the community. So community outreach, working with uh, community-based organizations, whether they're vet veteran organizations or some sort of caregiver coalition. Um, it, it's it's out, outreach. It's more than half the battle, um, and I, I I think that our missions of serving our our veterans in this case our veteran patients and caregivers um, coincide with one another to to really conduct that outreach. Um, I heard there uh, there were some data uh, some data questions coming here uh, pertaining to health care for veterans, and you know that's something that we we see because. I, the veteran population, they definitely define the, you know, the definition of population health. There's a lot of patterns and trends that we see in disease states and uh, physical and mental states that we see. So um, we try to bring that awareness, education, and access to the community, the, vet, the veteran community. So does that answer your question, No. Yes. Anyone else like to jump in? Sure. Yeah, I just say it almost 100% aligns with uh, what IAVA tries to do. And uh, one of the things I was going to mention, I meant to add to my testimony, is you know, we would love to help support in the outreach of getting DVS uh, awareness uh, to New York City. We're a national organization, but you know, we can certainly segment like our mailing uh, lists and stuff like that to let um, 
our members in New York know about the uh, the services because that really is what we do. It's the outreach. It's connecting veterans uh, to resources. It's making them aware of changing policies, and it's to help drive better policies, uh, both at the national level, uh, but also at the local level. Um, I would just like to uh, continue to support the message that's going out right now about the outreach portion of things. Uh, you know, speaking for NYC Veterans Alliance and, you know, myself personally, I've had a wonderful working relationship with DVS when it comes to, you know, getting inside of a room and trying to figure out uh, better ways to conduct outreach to, you know, the 210,000 or 210 uh, plus thousand veterans that are in New York City. Um, so continuing those efforts, enhancing uh, our ability once we do connect with those veterans, uh, I see that as 100% in line with NYC Veterans Alliance, and I look forward to continuing our relationship and uh, continuing to build on our capabilities working together. Thank you. And um, Commissioner, what I also heard was a, like a reoccurring theme was the need for an agency chief contracting officer. Um, And I wanted Veterans Alliance to give like just a, another example of um, some of the challenges you face with procurement in the process and um, what would, can you just give us like a, a, a quick example of how that particular position would be more helpful to you based on the work that you're doing and why D, D, DCAS is not helpful or DYCD? Excuse me, it, it was DCAS, I need to uh, correct myself. Uh, I need to correct myself on that uh, part of my testimony. It was DCAS that currently has oversight uh, of the uh, VET uh, Connect contract, uh, so I apologize for that earlier. Uh, w one of the things that um, we would like to see with the ACO is uh, a specialized expertise to the veteran community. Uh, that's one thing that hammers straight to the core of it. Uh, instead of having agencies and individuals that do not have that in-depth knowledge of the veteran community and the specialized needs for our community, um, I, I think we're still going to continue to uh, uh, fall short of our overall goals. Uh, but having someone in the room that understands the veteran community, the needs of that community, and how to roll out uh, individual policies uh, within those contracts, I feel is someone uh, that DVS uh, severely needs uh, to provide that vital oversight for the amount of contracts that we're currently sending out. Okay, and the other question I had was based on your testimony um, in the last page when you mentioned um, someone who would be able to provide consultation on and direct filing of VA claims. That's intriguing, you know, clearly, because when I'm sitting in different meetings, I hear all the time that someone only has like 30% or 40% or 50%, they should be at 100%, and working with other organizations um, through that process um, is very difficult, and it takes so many years. So do you think that having someone within your office would be able to assist with that type of process? I'm just trying I, to get an understanding. Absolutely. Because uh, currently right now it's being outsourced. But, you know, when it just boils down to the basics, uh, me as a veteran in the New York City area, when I think of what services are provided by DVS, the first thing that I would think of is, you know, helping me process a claim, uh, get connected to my benefits, get connected to the services that I've already earned. Currently, that's not within the wheelhouse of DVS as it currently stands. When it comes to me going in there as a veteran that needs to process a claim, I currently don't have the capabilities of doing that uh, as it stands today. Uh, but having someone in there with that expertise about, you know, uh, being able to advise and consent with someone's uh, individual case, I think would be uh, a, a vital uh, need that the uh, agency can bring in to help support the veteran community. Oh, you hear that, Commissioner? Oh. I have a <laughs> you want to add it? Yes, I, I definitely would like to piggyback off that. We, I was mentioning the population health demands that we see. Uh, by we, we track our veterans by war by war era, but also by their diagnosis. And there's a tons in, of service connected illnesses, not injuries I'm talking about, but illnesses. Um, and we track, you know, there's X amount of cancer or specific kind of cancer in the, in the Vietnam community, Y amount of Alzheimer's in the Korean, uh, Korean War community, X, X, Y, and Z. But tons of these patients, I've seen people with multiple Purple Hearts, prisoners of war, 
and and they were and their service and they have a presumptive con condition maybe of, of being exposed to Agent Orange and they have zero service connection. And with, like I said, usually in our type of care, time is against them, and their families are on the verge of bankruptcy. In my testimony um, towards the end of it, you'll see a case about a Staten Island veteran, um, and there's there's a link you could see uh, that was on I want to say about two years ago uh, on a news channel, and. You know, these families, not that anybody should have to experience it, but these are the last people who should have to experience it. And, um, you know, if there's, with 800 plus veteran cases, we do have a veterans benefits coordinator that works with us, but 800 uh, cases to address in a year is, is difficult for anybody. Um, but to have those outlets to work with DVS or any other, that's part of the outreach to work with those uh, veteran organizations to help with these claims that would be extremely beneficial to our patients for sure. I appreciate hearing that because of course when we're talking about the veterans and being able to figure out what's available and resources that, avail that are available for them and their families, you know, a big piece of it is the, the economics of it and being able to get what you are rightfully entitled to. And so to have a specialist in house would be, so that I thank you for adding that piece because this is the first time I've seen that piece added. So with that being said, I am going to turn this back over to the chair. One thing that I would also like to advocate for, um, yes, having a, a, an entity such as like a veteran service officer inside of DVS would be beneficial uh, to help, you know, begin the process or either uh, streamline the process of uh, filing claims, but also having uh, legal services provided within the community uh, to support those efforts as well. Uh, I, I understand that that may be a heavy lift for the agency to have that uh, in-house, but, you know, having a uh, robust support from either the council or um, a, another city agency to supplement the needed legal services to help those veterans that may need some type of uh, legal services to get an upgrade for their discharge in order to receive state benefits or receive city benefits. So the legal services component is a uh, vital piece of that as well. So that would be good to have in writing as an actual ask of individual council members within the, like this time frame with discretionary funding because I know we will um, allocate funding to legal services for so many other things and this has never been an ask of me before. So Absolutely. I'll definitely uh, touch base with your office and also your chair. Thank you. Good job. All right, thank you. Um, thank you so much, and I want to thank you for taking the time today to be here. Uh, next panel. And, and also, I want, to, I want to thank Mr. Alvarez for bringing up Roe, New York, and uh, I had the opportunity to visit Roe, New York several times, so thank you very much. Uh, next panel, uh, Kent. Kent Isla, uh, Sam, Peter Kemper, Joe Hunt, uh, Coco, and uh, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll go clockwise. That's not with you. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Deutsch. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Deutsch, and good afternoon to the honorable members. Uh,
Thank you, Chairman Deutsch, and good afternoon to you and the honorable members of this committee. My name is Ken Eiler. I'm the project director of the City Bar Justice Center's Veterans Assistance Project. Um, since the beginning of the city's Vet Department of Veterans Services in FY 2017, veterans and their service providers uh, have watched the nascent city agency with tremendous hope. People have understood that the footprint of DVS with its annual budget of a little over $5 million couldn't begin to compare with the $1.7 billion annual footprint in the city from the Federal Department of Veteran Affairs, VA, but it was never expected DVS would compare or compete with the feds. Instead, the hope and the reason so many veterans advocates supported the creation of DVS was the belief that this relatively small, nimble agency would be able to consult closely with the city's veterans and service providers to identify how the city could best identify gaps in services and meet the needs of the city's veterans in light of those gaps. At the federal level, leadership at the VA has long been criticized for being aloof. The rap on the VA is that far too often it prescribes policies that fail because those policies are informed by political appointees as opposed to primarily being concerned with efficacy, inputs from subject matter experts, and the needs of the veterans whom the VA is tasked to serve. The VA for decades has been burdened by the well-intentioned ideas from long ago departed political appointees. All too often when seeking a dialogue, veterans and their advocates are subject to a one-way conversation where it's the VA that does all of the talking. It's vital when DVS was created and remains vital today still that DVS avoid recreating at the local level the problems that veterans can experience at the federal level with the VA. It's vital that DVS be engaged with the city's veterans community. Its size and budget mean that to be effective, it must, prior to prescri prescribing policy, consult with service providers and subject matter experts to learn what services are being provided to veterans to avoid unnecessary duplication of existing services. Recently, DV announced, announced, excuse me, recently, DVS announced an upcoming event on February the 6th where it will discuss with community partners its quote 2020 strategic plan and vision for supporting veterans and their families in the future. This is a welcome development. At the February 6th event and events like it in the future, it will be important for DVS leadership to listen to community partners about what DVS priorities should be. With the realities of finite resources, it is vital that DVS demonstrate it as a good steward of the city's taxpayers' monies. DVS must relentlessly examine what it is doing and discard that which is not working while embracing what is working while continuing to seek further efficiencies. At present, the VA's $1.7 billion annual footprint in the city shrinks every year, as the, does the number of veterans in the city. According to the VA's National Center for Veterans Analysis and Statistics, the VA's fiscal footprint in New York City shrunk by more than $25 million in VA compensation and VA pension benefits from FY17 than it was in uh, to FY18. DVS should consider adopting, as part of its mission, plans on how to address the federal fiscal tide of VA dollars leaving New York to the extent that it can. One way this committee helps to stem that fiscal tide is through its Veterans Legal Initiative. The City Bar Justice Center's Veterans Assistance Project is pleased to be included as part of that initiative. The mission of the Veterans Assistance Project at the City Bar is making sure veterans have competent legal counsel to ensure the VA is paying veterans the compensation benefits they have earned through their military service. Despite the VA's $1.7 billion annual footprint across the five boroughs today, not a penny of that $1.7 billion from the feds is outlaid towards veterans-focused legal services due to present legal limitations the VA has placed on the funding of legal services. While more certainly can and should be done at both the city and the state level, the Veterans Legal Initiative is just one example of the city identifying a gap in services and then taking steps to try to mitigate that gap. By embracing an approach of engagement with the city's veterans community, of demanding efficiency, and a commitment to rooting out service gaps, DVS will have before it a new, exciting, prosperous future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kent. So, Kent, uh, obviously, uh, you're in touch with DVS, right? Right here? Um, we participate, Chairman, in the, uh, we're a referral source from VetConnect. So, we do get referrals from VetConnect from time to time uh, who have cases that VetConnect has suggested they reach out and contact us. So uh, are you satisfied with the way they connect to you for services? And if you have any questions, do you have like uh, an open dialogue with DVS? Um, I, I, am, I am always happy to engage with DVS anytime that they would like to engage with me. And and I I will I'll make make that outreach effort again. Yeah. I'm happy uh, to do how how often does DBS contact like um, organizations and agencies such as yourself? 
to, to just find out, you know, because you're a referral, mm -hmm. like how often do they contact you and say, okay, is everything okay? Is there anything that we need to, uh, to offer any, anything that DBS has, you know, in order for you to, to better, to be more efficient and to make sure that everything is running smooth, do you get, do you receive calls from DBS just to follow up? It has not been on a regular basis, Chairman. Okay, so I think we, we should um, make sure that. Okay, thank you, Kent. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Kempner, and I'm the Legal Director at Volunteers of Legal Service. Uh, one of the programs that I oversee is our Veterans Initiative, which conducts free uh, weekly legal clinics at the Manhattan campus of the VA uh, healthcare system, uh, where we provide free civil legal services to low-income veterans age 60 and over. A core part of our work is providing wills and other advanced directives uh, to low-income senior veterans. Uh, these critical documents ensure that the wishes of senior veterans are carried out by the people they uh, love and trust the most, and they also ensure that veterans are able to live in the community for as long as possible, uh, and they prevent displacement and help avoid co costly and unpleasant legal proceedings like guardianships if veterans become incapacitated. Um, I also teach the, the Veterans Legal Clinic at New York Law School and have been involved with providing veterans legal services for the greater part of a decade. Uh, we thank the council for having this oversight uh, hearing today. Um, as DVS enters its fourth year, I think it's a great time for both DVS and the City Council to reflect on, on what we've done as a community to improve the lives of New York City's veterans, but also to look forward to see how we could do better um, as a community to serve those who have served us. Uh, I would like to highlight two issues today, one of which has actually been talked about uh, already, uh, but to add my perspective, and that is access to, to benefits from the Department of Veterans Affairs for New York City's veterans. And the second is uh, the city's efforts to continue to address the veteran homelessness issue. Uh, this past summer, actually, the Association of the Bar of the City of New York published a report um, concerning the inadequate financial support for legal services for veterans in connection to VA benefits. The report highlighted several disturbing facts. New York State actually has the fifth largest veteran population in the country, but lags far behind other states in the number of benefits that are received by our veterans from the VA. Um, Less than 17% of the New York's veterans statewide receive either service-connected disability benefits or VA pension, while the national average is 23 to 24% of veterans receiving those benefits. In addition, as per VA's own statistics, New York veterans have lower income and lower educational attainment than other veterans, showing that they probably need the VA benefits more, not less, than other veterans across the country. It isn't because our veterans are healthier um, than veterans elsewhere in the country that they're receiving less benefits. It's because access to those benefits are not being uh, supported and encouraged in the same way they are perhaps elsewhere. Um, and a lack of legal services funding um, to represent people who uh, are before the VA, whose initial claims have been denied, uh, would make great strides in, 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 in conquering that. He hearing from the gentleman from, from VNS about veterans who are at the end of life, who have presumptive service-connected disability um, related to Agent Orange exposure is, is just appalling. Um, these people should know about uh, their access to those benefits much earlier. It shouldn't be spotted when they are at their end of life, and we should be engaging them throughout. And I think this does speak to the issue of outreach, but it also speaks to the issue of making sure that uh, veterans have adequate legal services available to them with respect to VA benefits, and that just is not happening in New York City right now. There is a model, though, that New York State has with respect to this, um, and that's in the area of, of Social Security benefits. Uh, New York State has a program called DAP, the Disability Advocacy Project, um, where we provide legal services to, to we provide funding to legal services providers to represent people before the Social Security Administration who are disabled. There's a recognition there that if you get somebody off onto Social Security benefits, they come off of state and local benefits, so they, they're not, no longer on public assistance benefits. They're getting federally funded benefits at that point. That also means an influx of, of millions of dollars, which is something that Kent mentioned uh, in his testimony. We could have millions of dollars more flowing into the New York State and New York City economy 
if we have more federally funded benefits for our veterans. In addition, it's just the right thing to do. If somebody has a service-connected disability or they've served during wartime and are entitled to a VA pension, we should ensure that veterans have access to those benefits. And I think having free legal services for those veterans um, would be a, a, a real strive in that direction, and we have models for that right now as well. The second issue I want to briefly talk about um, is with, with respect to <clears throat> veteran homelessness. Right now, we have, I think, as, as the councilwoman had mentioned before, we have funded a huge amount of, of legal services, um, particularly in the area of, home, of eviction prevention. Um, and so the Universal Access to Council program has been historic in New York City. We've made huge strides in cutting back the number of evictions that happen. And we all know this is a recognition that um, the best way to stop homelessness is prevented from happening in the first place. People will not end up in shelter if they don't get evicted. And, and HRA has done amazing things with universal access to counsel, yet there have been countless veterans who have been cut out of this program for two reasons. First is that they're rolling it out zip code by zip code, and we have encountered many veterans who go to these legal services providers who don't live in the designated zip codes and say, you're not, at, you're not eligible. The second thing is based on income. Right now, somebody has to be at or below 200% of the federal poverty level in order to qualify for universal access to counsel. Somebody who is 100% service-connected disabled will receive about $3,000 a month from the VA. That puts them at 300% of the federal poverty level, and they are excluded from receiving free legal services in an eviction case under the Universal Access to Counsel program because they are over income. These are people who have sacrificed the most in service to their country, and they are being told when they face eviction that they're too rich because they get $3,000 a month in the VA in order to get free counsel, and that's just wrong. We need to make sure that all veterans who are facing eviction are being given free attorneys to help them prevent being come homeless. Um, the other thing is with the administration of this program is that HRA is not screening for veteran status when people come to their office uh, in order to, to, to try to get this help from legal services providers. HRA is not asking tenants, have you served, have you worn the uniform? Instead, they say, you're outside the zip code, you're over income, you're not eligible. And what we need to be doing as far as interagency cooperation is concerned is to make sure that HRA is aware of these issues, HRA is screening for veteran status, all agencies should be screening, screening for veteran status when administering um, benefits and services to, to all New Yorkers, because um, that way we could build the list of people who we know are veterans and could, out, could perform the proper outreach to them. Um, so those are two areas I think that going forward we need to focus on as a community to make sure that veterans have access to the benefits to which they deserve and also access to programs we have in New York City to make sure that they don't become homeless. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have two, uh, two questions for you, Peter. Um, First of all, uh, how many how many veterans uh, are being like, according to your to the calls that you receive, how many veterans are being evicted? Like, uh, if you give me like approximate number, like, do you think it's like a lot? It's a, it's a high amount, and, and also for what reasons are they being evicted? For? I think that number's unknown because, frankly, we're not tracking it, right? Um, HRA doesn't know how many people they're turning away who are veterans because they're not asking them. Um, and so perhaps the people who would know are, are DHS to see how many new veterans are going into the shelters and how many are going into the shelters because they were evicted. Uh, but that's not numbers that, 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 that I know or that the people who are administering right to counsel know either. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second question? Uh, second, and for what reasons are they being evicted? I think it's a wide range. I mean, I think it ranges from non-payment of rent cases uh, to holdover cases. Um, and, and a lot of these things are avoidable, frankly, um, especially the non-payment of rent cases. We could access SSVF services. We could access one-shot deals from HRA. Veterans should be getting access to city FEPs. 
um, to give them the financial supports they need to pay ongoing rent. And, and so identifying veterans is extremely important because then we know what resources in the community to hook them up with. So how would they know to come to you? How would they know to go to you? Well, we actually don't even provide representation of veterans in housing court because we're not funded for that. Um, and there are certain legal services providers that do, but many of the legal service providers um, who are the big providers under universal access to counsel don't have special veteran carve-outs, don't get funding for this. And, and the same with them. When they see veterans who are outside the zip codes or over income, they're turning them away as well. So how, how do we know when a veteran is being evicted, how would that veteran know that they need to contact someone, or do they contact someone? They don't know. So we don't, And we, that's the problem. Okay. If the courts screen for veteran status, if HRA screen for veteran status, these people could be found much earlier in the process and try to get them to a legal services provider who could help, or better yet, provide a blanket exception for all veterans who are facing eviction to make sure that they have access to universal right to counsel. Um, and that way they won't have to be knocking on the doors or going to Vet Connect or wherever it is. They will get right to counsel through the courthouse at the very beginning of an eviction proceeding. Yeah. So I'd like to do two things. Uh, firstly, I want to ask the Commissioner if when we do the outreach, if we could mention this. Um, this should be part of the thing that if, if you're a veteran and you're being evicted, they should notify DBS. Um, that's why it's important for people to know who to contact. And number two, if um, you could speak to, to Joe Bello, and I'd love to set up a meeting with HRA and okay. bring this up to them, and let's, let's see if we can get it done. If we have to put in the bill in the city council, let's, let's do that. Whatever, whatever it takes for them to track, for HRA to get involved and to have early detection, let's get it done. So I would love to, if you could have a conversation with Joe, and let's set up the meeting. Absolutely. Yeah, so very important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Sam Sloan. I am a public defender with the New York County Defender Services. We are one of the primary public defender offices in Manhattan. I believe we represent roughly a quarter of the criminal cases that come through the system in a given year. Um, throughout my time as a public defender, I've handled cases from arraignment through trial, but I've also had extensive experience with the various alternatives to incarceration offered in both uh, Manhattan criminal and but mostly Supreme Court, which is um, to say felonies. Um, and this has led me to my recent role as the Veterans Court Specialist with New York County Defender Services. Um, you know, so as a Veterans Court Specialist, I think as an organization rather, we're trying to do a number of things. Um, and this is sort of a theme that I've heard throughout um, testimony today. Number one, we're trying to identify clients that we have who have a prior history of military service. Um, one of the first questions we ask people in, in arraignments is if they have any experience, um, if, they're, if they're veterans or any experience with military service. And I think um, somewhat anecdotally, but um, from my personal experience, it's, it's been astounding that people will not bring it up voluntarily. Um, they will tend to, for a variety of reasons, um, sort of it, it might take uh, three times meeting them before you find out that they've served um, back in the 70s for four years. Um, so we are trying to um, do our best to identify. Once we've identified somebody, um, the next step is generally to sort of connect them with services. Again, this is something that we've sort of heard, and I think we share similar goals with um, VDS and everyone else at this table. Um, because it's also been remarkable how um, our clients either don't know they're eligible, um, or maybe have fallen off um, or fallen behind on certain eligibility requirements for various services, whether that's through the VA um, or through a city agency. Um, and uh, again, so helping them connect with our social work staff. Um, the, the next thing we do is for those people that are eligible, we try to screen them for uh, Manhattan Veterans Treatment Court, which is um, it primarily, I guess at this point, only exists for pending felonies, generally nonviolent felonies, but there are, um, with the prosecution's consent, we can, um, a few sort of qualifying violent felonies um, can be um, eligible. Uh, these are also individuals who st uh, are generally facing mandatory prison um, sentences, um, quite lengthy sometimes. 
Um, and I think one of the main benefits with Manhattan Veterans Treatment Court, as opposed to some of the other treatment courts, um, is that everyone in the treatment court is a veteran. The court staff, some of them are veterans. Um, there are peer mentors who are volunteers who are veterans in the room. There is the local VJO, um, Veterans Justice Outreach, which I believe is um, through the VA. They are all there. Um, but I think it also brings um, our clients into the sort of the tribe or the bring them back into a fray. It surrounds them with um, people who have shared their similar experiences, but it also gives them a sense of pride. Um, our clients, you know, we're not usually meeting them in their best moments. Um, and I think, again, this is going to be somewhat anecdotally, but we have noticed higher success rates with this treatment court, um, probably for um, reasons I've mentioned. Um, because I'm somewhat new in this role, I have not had an opportunity to work directly with DVS, but I think um, some of the issues that we have um, in getting our clients access to services, um, I think are, you know, shared, and I, and I truly um, welcome the opportunity to, to work with you going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question. You have approximately um, probably like 5,500 people uh, in prison right now in Rikers Island. Is there any way to, to know how many veterans are actually sitting in Rikers today? Yeah, so, so one of the things we do is um, if, if we have a veteran that is incarcerated, we will flag um, the, the VJO, which is the Veterans Justice Outreach Worker, who I just know through um, my work with Manhattan Veterans Treatment Court. I know they are working to set up a wing of Rikers for veterans. It does not currently exist for people who are sentenced, but only for those that have cases pending. Um, but again, it, it's usually relying on somebody catching it along the line and notifying um, the VJO, who will then go and um, try to get them moved into the veterans' wing. So uh, with the closing of Rikers, uh, they're going to be opening up uh, four borough-based jails. Because the truth is, I haven't heard anything about anything in the local jails that the city is planning on opening up about veterans. Uh, so I, I know they're supposed to bring in different resources, but there's a few things. Number one is that services for veterans, um, there are resources, right? So the city pays tens of thousands of dollars um, for a person who is, who is in jail, right? So first of all, services come from the federal government, a lot of it, for servicing the veterans. And then their needs are a little different than, maybe different than, than others who are sitting in, in jail who are incarcerated. So the question is, um, how do we identify? And also working with the local government to find out in the, in the borough-based jails with all the services they're planning on having, what is there for veterans? And I don't want to speak if this is already happening, but I think that w one thing that we try to do is ha coordinate with discharge planning. And dis like most people who are, um, you know, if, you're, if it's a city sentence or you're on your way out, they're, they're going to get assigned a discharge plan or somewhere along the way through corrections. And if we can coordinate discharge planning with veteran services, when they're stepping out, they can immediately get help with their HRA benefits. Because most of our clients, I, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of our clients are um, homeless or functionally homeless. And so um, to get the ball rolling before they leave, I think, is a, is a big help. But um, as far as identifying mechanisms, I don't know. I think CGA is trying to do that. But again, sometimes it takes three or four times um, to sort of ask a question before you get a straightforward answer because if CJA asks them during criminal court arraignment, a lot of times people just are not in a great place at that moment. So they might have been asleep or who knows. Um, and then usually the first time we meet them, again, not a great moment. But um, throughout, you know, uh, it, at some point they will open up and then it's, you know, our job to sort of notify all, you know, discharge planners, social workers, anyone involved that we have a a pending, you know, a veteran client. Great. Um, if you don't mind, if, if you don't mind, if you could um, leave your number with uh, Joe, and I'd love to have uh, another conversation. And when, when when there's a conversation, when conversations are had in the city about the new borough based jails, I'd love to have your input and in working um, with the city to make sure that we have the right, the proper veteran services within within the jails, within, within the jails. So. 
We'd love that too. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Coco. Infamous. Coco. Hi, infamous. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, good afternoon. I, my name is Coco Colhane. I'm the executive director of the Veteran Advocacy Project. We provide free legal services to low income veterans. Uh, and their families, and we focus on working with those with mental health conditions. I just want to say that CJA is identifying veterans. There are There is a veterans unit. There are a number of different sort of advocacy networks that are working depending on the borough. Um, we're involved in a couple of boroughs, so would love to talk further about that if anyone wants to. Anyway, so I want to start by saying um, that I have worked over the last 10 years with incredible advocates at MOVA and DVS. Um, we depend on them, the services, that, their dedication to their constituent services is, um, they really go above and beyond. And one of the things in the lead up to this hearing, we actually did some testing because we were wondering, well, you know, people from VAP are calling, uh, perhaps that's why we're getting such good results. And we had some of our clients call and ask for information in several areas and it was incredible. The quality that they got back, the thorough, how thorough the information was, it was really something to be emulated. So I wanna start with that. Um, and I wanna say the problem is no one would ever know that. Um, there's no data, uh, you know, outside of sort of the homelessness and housing efforts, uh, there's just painfully little data that's been released. Uh, the law that was passed last year that required DVS to publish on their website um, any number of specific values, um, I couldn't find today. It was supposed to be there by December 15th, 2019. Um, and if we look at the mayor's management report, which was, I think, just about two pages, um, you know, others have mentioned that the number of constituents served went down a little bit. And then the rest of the report was really like we added the word families to our goals. I mean, that's about all the information that we got. Um, so what does get published and what has been highlighted, I think, in the past um, are a series of really big ideas with these verbose press releases. And then there's no follow through. Um, and if you look through all of these things that DVS has announced, it's monumental. It's incredible, all the things that they're doing. I mean, the number of ideas, but I can't find evidence that these things are happening. Um, so, you know, what we need is solid programs and transparency. Um, you know, one of the examples uh, is that last year we did hear about DVS doing justice-involved um, outreach, and we were thrilled. And I reached out to someone and said, hey, we just launched this initiative ourselves. Let's team up. And um, I was told it was just a press release that uh, DVS had gone to the opening of the Veterans Unit and had never been out there again. There was no involvement. So that loses trust, right? That loses trust among the advocate community, and it does the veteran community, no good. Um, another example, and maybe I'll just skip over this, core four. I mean, I've said it so many times. Um, it's, it's a model, and apparently it's been touted now globally. Um, but what good is a model if it's not actually being used? You know, the, the, the main base is supposed to be arts and culture. Um, as far as I could tell, theater of war has been, you know, since 2017, has been the only thing that you can find on the website. So what's being done, right? What are, and if you go through each level, um, every organization has no clue what their responsibility really is. So once again, what is core for? What is it doing? Um, and I wanna also say, you know, if you look at what DVS listed as their priorities, for the coming year. You know, last year they said vets on campus, mentor a vet, uh, veteran career council. So another current city employee told me as I was checking on this, that the mentor a vet that, um, initiative was they got all these different organizations into a room once and nothing ever happened again. That's not a program, right? And I'm not, DVS cannot be all things to all people. Um, they can't 
go out to Rikers, provide benefits, provide outreach, provide all this excellent information, um, take on legal services, right? Like they cannot do that. So what needs to be done is there needs to be a realistic fo focus um, and follow through and accountability. Um, right now, there is, there's just no accountability. And if you look, you know, recently they said that they've changed the website. They have this great new uh, element on the website. So you, you click on uh, Get Help, it takes you to Vet Connect and a resources map. I entered housing into this resources map and it took me to some location in Malawi. I think that's an embarrassment. I think that the idea that that is sitting on our website, and I say our because as a community we are responsible, that's an embarrassment. Um, another law was they were supposed to create a resources guide. So if you go on the website, it says July 2019. Click open. It's an April 2019 infographic that lists the topics that a veteran might come to DVS for. It doesn't you know, actually list resources. Um, it does a few, I should, sorry, I should correct. It does a few. Um, Ken Eiler's organization is listed, um, seeing that it will solve any legal problem. And um, in fact, that's not true. And also Kent is so overwhelmed and has a backlog in the areas he does provide, right? So I just, I think that these things need to be highlighted. There needs to be change. Um, the startup report, um, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing. Like the list of accomplishments that aren't even DVSs, right? And, and I say this because there, are, there is incredible work being done. And that needs to be highlighted, it needs to be the focus, it needs to be counted. Um, the data that was supposed to come from that, and maybe, the, maybe that report has been published, I don't know, I just couldn't find it. That data is key, and all of us, all of the advocates in the room can use that data to better focus our services. Um, so this isn't, I, I don't think that this is just me infamously attacking, right? I mean, um, we need to do better. And I think we're at this amazing moment where we can, where there's change. And, um, you know, we definitely look forward to working with the new commissioner and to the incredible people who, who do make up this agency. Um, but I think all of us need to demand absolutely accountability and transparency. Thank you. Thank you, Coco. Um, so I just want to ask uh, the commissioner um, that uh, two things. Number one, if you had, do you have a uh, a liaison to the VA? Do you have a liaison to the VA from DBS within DBS? No, we don't. Yeah. That's, to my knowledge. So okay. And also, so I think what's important is what, what I've been hearing so far from the panel that if we could, if you could assign someone to be the liaison to the VA to organizations such as Kent and, and some others here, so this way, if they have issues with the VA, this way we have someone who's the goal in between uh, to advocate for some of the things that they may need in order to help, help, help their clients. Uh, and number two, I think it's important to also have someone assigned um, within DVS to be um, in touch with all the advocate groups, like Coco and others here, and everyone, I think, just to get, receive the feedback, because it's easy to refer you know, veterans to them, but then without getting the feedback, and I see how frustrated Coco is today. Never. Never. <laughs> but how passionate she was today. Yes. Yes. Um, and. Yeah, sure. So just to, to, to clarify, sorry. Um, as far as the liaison to VA, we have our constituent services, you know, component within our office that is there. That's the closest thing that we have as far as, uh, you know, that that uh, body. And then one of the other demographics that I mentioned before was actually the VSOs, the Veteran Service Organizations, which is really what you call advocates. So leaders such as the folks who've been testifying to just touch base with that leadership so we've got that constant synergy with you all. So, 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 so do they have do they have a contact? Do you have a contact? Anyone in DVS? Uh, Peter? Any, do you have a contact? 
not to directly criticize, we our veterans initiative is new. I've been doing this work for for almost a decade. Another organization recently came to Vols and started our veterans initiative, and and we've been actually desperately trying to get on Vets Connect NYC, and have sent I don't know a dozen emails and had a phone call, and and we can't get ourselves on listed to be able to to let folks know that we're providing the service in the community. Did you get so, Did you get a reason why you're not listed? I mean, we're new, and so, you know, there was a process there, and I appreciate that process, but, you know, we had a call three months ago and sent follow-up emails, and Joe. I'm going to call <laughs> Joe. Um, but, but, but I don't know if, like, how many other organizations are experiencing that kind of thing and becoming frustrated. You know, I'm trying not to be frustrated because I, I, I get how hard it is and how much they have on their plate, um, but... The, these are the realities we face. Okay, all right. Yeah, sure. It's something I didn't clarify, forgive me. When I speak about... Yeah, Commissioner, uh, you could pull the chair up. Yeah, with the wall. Sit with the cool kids. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to go out of order. We're all family here. When, when, I, so when, I, when I speak about us being configured in current operations, future operations, and admin, these things are going to take effect after the HOPE count, formally. And HOPE count is our count of our homeless population in the city of New York. Uh, I'll be in Sheep's Head Bay, by the way. Um, that count is going to occur on the 27th. The 28th is when we're going to have some final moves in place. So we're doing a transition where it's going to be fully locked in, but we'll have people who have dedicated to do things like this in their roles on the 28th, just so you know what's coming. Okay. So yeah. someone's going to be in touch. No, you could, yeah, you can feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I just, so I just want to mention another thing. So regarding the advocates, is there anyone that could constant, could, could, who could be in touch with the advocate groups just to make sure that um, they're okay, if they have any questions, that they can answer their questions? Yes, so absolutely, yes. And that's there's someone for whom that's their outreach. That's their portfolio is just and the leaders who, who of the Veterans that? Service Organization. You know who that is? It's, um, the, the, well, the per, I wanted to wait until we had our actual, or, you know, until we lock in the organizational change on the 28th to announce that. Oh, okay, just, you know, all right. We have someone identified. Okay, we'll, you know, af, okay. After, uh, really, as of January 28th, okay. we're going to uh, name that right. person. We already have someone. Okay, so, Coco, that's yeah. helpful, right? Yeah. yeah. We have, so I speak regularly with um, Inez Adan. Aiden and um, other people, we have good communication with okay. constituent services. I, I don't think, I mean, I, I, I can't speak to that. I'm just saying that there have been a lot of announcements that we try to be a part of, and then it turns out there's nothing. Yeah, see, that, yeah, you know, so I always tell my constituents that um, don't wait for me to come to a monthly meeting that, you know, people are going to complain to me about the, about, you know, issues that affect them, but reach out right away. So I think we need to to constantly, you know, listen to what you have to say and others have to say by contacting my office and working with DBS. And you're right, because things move kind of slow, and then and then we get frustrated. And so I think we, you know, we have a new commissioner here, and um, let's let's build, you know, the relationship. Let's build upon the relationship. And if you have anything, you could always CC me in the email. This way, I could see what's going on. You could CC Joe. This way we see. No, this way we see. This way we see what's going on. Like when you send DBS an email, let us see it. You right, know? but I mean, so for instance, if I I spoke with someone this morning about the treatment courts, and I said, are, are you, you know, there was this announcement that in July an assessment was done, and they're working on what to do to support them, and I said, has anything actually happened? And they said, no. So I'm not going to email someone and say. Of course not. Hey, you know what I mean? It's yeah. so it's it's a I think it's just a question of, of of a refocusing and I think we're at that point and I think that everyone is excited about that. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay. And and I and also I just want to add the, the discharge upgrade issue that this, you know, the mayor did announce um, supporting that, which is fantastic and and the 15 percent, it's much higher, I think, in the city. Um, and these veterans have been left behind. And um, both DBS and you know, everyone's commitment to this population is is much appreciated. OK. Excellent. Thank you, Coco. OK. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Charlotte Martin, and I work at the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum. Great place. Yes, thank you. 
please come. Um, and I work there as Senior Manager of Access Initiatives. I have the privilege of overseeing the museum's Veterans Access Initiative, for which we offer a range of programs and resources for current and former service members and their families. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the generous financial and advisory support of the City Council Committee on Veterans. So thank you to Chair Deutsch, Council Members Ambry Samuel, Valone, Eugene, and Maisel, and the committee's staff for your ongoing efforts to connect veterans with one another and with cultural resources like the Intrepid Museum. At the Intrepid Museum, our mission is to promote the awareness and understanding of history, science, and service in order to honor our heroes, educate the public, and inspire our youth. Centered on a former Navy aircraft carrier, we have long engaged veterans through Veterans Day Memorial Day events, Fleet Week activities, a robust volunteer program, and free admission for veterans. In fall of 2015, we extended these efforts with the launch of free military family programs. The Welcome Active Military Family is looking for an opportunity to explore the city, recently returned veterans uh, seeking a way to spend time and reconnect with family, older veterans sharing their military experience with grandchildren for the first time, and Gold Star families looking for a possible a positive experience after loss. At the same time, we started offering free tours to a PTS support group at the Bronx VA, and we now offer free tours to any New York City-based veterans organization. We soon expanded to offering intrepid after hours, evening programs exclusively for current and former service members with behind the scenes opportunities, veteran led creative workshops, catered dinner, and plenty of bonding across branches, service eras, and post-service experience. We now also offer special Veterans Plus programs, including film screenings, performances, a pride event, and now a book club for veterans and their guests. And we offer vet video chats, interactive live tours over video chat for veterans, local and far away, otherwise unable to visit the museum. Last November, we hosted our first ever Veterans Job and Resource Fair, which also featured work workshops on networking, resume writing, and other skills. We've benefited from staff trainings led by experts at the NYU Langone's Cohen Military Family Center and the New York Presbyterian Military Family Wellness Center, and from the advice and feedback of our, outs of our standing Council of Veteran Advisors. Um, and I'll note that we always have a resource table at our programs, and we're happy to add more. Through this all, we have developed a close and fruitful relationship with DVS. We were honored to be the venue for the signing of the bill that officially created DVS out of the Mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs, and also to be the venue for the recent, recent announcement of the transition from Commissioner Sutton to Commissioner Hendon. Since we started our Council of Veteran Advisors, we have always had a veteran, veteran representative of DVS on the Council sharing feedback on program ideas and connecting us with resources. <coughs> Both commissioners and their staff have been responsive to our questions and ideas and have shared our programs via their e-newsletter and social media. They have been advocates for the important role cultural organizations and the arts can and should play in the lives of veterans and their families and in serving as foundations for community, which we agree with and greatly appreciate. DVS and the City Council's recognition of how cultural experiences can strengthen veteran communities and encourage personal growth has been instrumental in the expansion and deepening of the Intrepid Museum's programs and participants over the years. And I know other museums are taking notice. We believe DVS is a critical agency for all these reasons. We are hopeful it continues to be adequately funded and managed in order that it can continue to have the proper resources to help serve our veteran and other organizations that serve veterans as collective programming matures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and also I want to thank uh, I want to thank you for hosting uh, the seniors. Uh, we have about 150 seniors that are intrepid. So thank you for that. It's our pleasure. Yeah. Um, any questions? No. All right. And um, Joe Hunt. I guess I'm bad at cleanup. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chairman Deutsch, and Councilmember Avery uh, Samuels, for this opportunity to testify regarding. New York City's Department of Veteran Services going forward. My name is Joe Hunt. I'm a U.S. Army veteran, and I serve as the director of the Veterans Mental Health Coalition in New York City. Uh, the coalition is made up of over <clears throat> 850 members, representing 388 different organizations that serve the veterans, veteran co military-connected community in New York City. Uh, the coalition is administered by Vibrant Emotional Health, Vibrant was formerly known as the Mental Health Association of New York City. To be respectful of time and get to the point, I'm going to give you the cliff notes of my testimony. You have the, my full testimony in front of you. For the past four years, the Veterans Mental Health Coalition has made the point in all of our testimony to city council committees on veterans and on mental health and in meetings with DVS that nearly half of all service members returning to civilian life in New York State return with psychological industries or substance abuse issues, yet only one-third seek 
only one-third Sikhs treatment. Uh, for those who may not have served in the military, it may be surprising to learn that another uh, major factor affecting the emotional well-being of veterans is transitioning back to civilian life. They're leaving supportive communities built upon rigorous regimen and established supports and are bas basically cut loose to fend for themselves upon separation. Uh, Jim McDonough, who I think many of us know, uh, the director of New York State Division of Veteran Services compared transitioning to becoming homeless and unemployed all at once. Imagine that. There are two pr primary reasons why veterans don't address their behavioral health and emotional health needs. First, the stigma associated with mental health treatment still persists. Second, their emotional well-being is not their top priority. A report from the Institute of Veterans and Military Families, which supports VetConnect and six other coordination centers like VetConnect, indicated that most frequently requested services are housing, employment, and benefits navigation. These services accounted for 49% of all requests. Only 1% of nearly 65,000 requests were for mental health or substance use services. Given this information, and I've said this before in testimony, given this information, it's reasonable to estimate that 67 of 100 veterans who have clinically significant behavioral health needs are initially seeking service from non-mental health providers. Non-mental health providers are an important gateway to connecting veterans to behavioral self services. In connection with that, we're working with the Department of Veteran Services to help promote mental health first aid for non-mental health uh, providers, as well as those uh, providers who are part of the VetConnect network. And early intervention is our best opportunity to reduce deaths by suicide um, among, other, uh, among our brothers and sisters who have served in the military. Vibrant and the uh, Veterans Mental Health Coalition supported the creation of New York City's Department of Veteran Services to meet the needs of New York City's veterans, National Guard service members, their families, and caregivers. And we applauded DVS's acquisition of VetConnect. VetConnect is a valuable resource for information and referrals that Lake New York City uh, military connected community to an array of service providers across a wide variety of sectors. To maximize the potential that VetConnects holds requires increased community awareness of its service and the inclusion of more providers in its network. VetConnects' Vet enormous potential as a tool for making more informed decisions cannot be overstated. Today, most of the research that we see from the VA and elsewhere is at least two years old. VetConnect's ability to collect and report timely, relevant information about the number of requests, the types of services requested, as well as the source of the requests and referrals is invaluable. Armed with this information, DVS community -based and community-based providers will be better able to respond to the demand for different types of services, identify the types of clients requesting services, and develop strategies for early intervention and the reduction in deaths by suicide and measure their outcomes. That, uh, the Veterans Mental Health Coalition holds great hope for Commissioner James Sutton and the DVS team, but hope is not enough. We'd like to see DVS, one, publicly communicate its goals and regularly report on the key performance indicators it uses to track its performance. Two, work more collaboratively collaboratively with the community of providers and engage them into achieving these goals. Recruit and onboard more qualified providers in the VetConnect network to enhance its value and benefit to the community. Four, actively encourage VetConnect providers to make all behavioral health referrals through the VetConnect network. And five, finally, Establish a robust communications campaign to ensure that New York City's military-connected community is aware of VetConnect and the types of services available. Thank you for this opportunity to present the testimony today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? No. Uh, thank you, Joe. And I want to thank the commissioner for staying throughout the hearing. 
Uh, and I want to thank all the advocates for taking of your time to be being here today and for laughing at my jokes. Thank you very much. Oh, there we go again. So uh, thanks once again, and uh, God bless the United States of America, and God bless you all. Meetings adjourned. Thank you.